today. I have uh, Ms. Gomes, Mr. Keller, and Mr. Klinger present for the state. I have Mr. Igars present with Mr. Peterson, who likewise is present. We are outside the presence of the jury. State, is there anything you need me to address before we get the witness back on the witness stand and go forward with the cross-examination? Judge, just one thing. Our third witness of the day works in an undercover capacity, and so he'll be wearing the full face covering. I did let defense counsel know, letting the court know his he plans on raising any objections so that we can deal with it before the witness walks in so the court's not caught off guard. As I told the state, I have no objections. You have no objections? Zero. Okay. Okay, so without objection from the defense, I guess uh, we'll proceed uh, as the state wishes. State, anything else? No, Judge. Defense, anything you need me to address? No, Your Honor. State, can I ask you, did I see some evidence with Madam Clerk uh, from Mr. Cruz's trial? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Some of the shell cases. Are they going to be entered into evidence in this case? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. It'll be this afternoon, yes. Do we have, a, what I'm most concerned about is that I don't want, um, I mean, it's not the usual, like with co-defendants, but are the, jur are the stickers going to be affixed in a manner so that they, the jurors are unaware that this was evidence in yes, the other case? Yes, that's the intention. I already spoke with Ms. Wilcox that I'll be putting the stickers right. exactly over the stickers as they yeah. were. Well, she's, we've had great experience in that area, again, dealing with co-defendants uh, and trying the same cases multiple times. So. Right. I just want to... Not the white sticker, the pink sticker. You're talking about the, um, the barcode. Yes. What does the barcode, does the barcode have any words on it or does it just have a barcode? The barcode says, for instance, looking at for our clerk reports, state exhibit 240, date 10-13-2020. Uh, it has a case number and then it has a description. Do you have any objection if those stickers are on there? No, you don't. Okay. So, and you understand, if you did, I would figure out some mechanism or procedure where they wouldn't be on there. You have no but objection. I don't guess it's a secret that uh, there's been a prior trial. No, no objection at all. Okay. okay. Uh, state, anything else before we get going? No, you're not. In defense, you're ready to proceed? I am, Your Honor. All right, one thing I do need to put on the record, um, this is regarding the continued issue with juror number six. Um, I did communicate with the head of the Human Resources Department of her company. Uh, I'm going to keep all that information for me at the present time. Uh, by my count, this is day seven of the trial. Uh, she has 10 days before her company's policy, I guess, requires her to start using her PTO time, which obviously I don't want that to happen. Um, I'm currently waiting on communication from the head of their legal department and or the CEO of the company. I will share with you. Um, since I had to go a little deeper into this, that uh, the revenues of this company, which juror number six works last year, was $7.8 billion. $7.8 billion with a B. So uh, I have very high hopes they're going to be able to pay her for the jury service. Uh, and I told them if I can't resolve the issue at this point, uh, I might resolve it in a more public manner, but hopefully that will resolve the issue, but I will keep you updated. Okay. Uh, okay, so then uh, can we get the witness back on the witness stand, please? I'll put him under oath and then we'll bring the jury back in. Sir, if I could have you come right back to the witness stand, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I, even though we're outside the presence of the jury, I'm going to swear you in. Again. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Okay, you may be seated. And once you are seated, you can scoot that chair all the way forward again. And then please bring the jury back. Thank you.
gentlemen, welcome back. Come on in. Once you're back at those same seats, you may be seated. All right, all the parties may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you using the notepads, I'll give you a moment to get those notepads back out. <coughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. I hope you had a nice weekend back at your normal lives. Uh, I apologize for the slight delay in getting started this morning. Someone told me that one of you was late getting here, but I find that impossible to believe that that could have happened. So <laughs> I will take the blame for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we pressed pause on the trial on Friday, we had just concluded the direct examination of the witness. The witness remains on the stand and under oath. So at this point, we're going to proceed with the cross-examination of the witness. Mr. Agars, when you are ready, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May I please support the state? Good morning. Good morning, Officer Burton. Good morning, sir. This is the second time we've met, correct? Yes, on uh, the depot and today. Okay. The depot is short for deposition, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, you and I spoke, and I asked you a number of questions about what took place that day, correct? You did, sir. And there was a court reporter present that recorded everything that was said between us? Uh, it was over video, but yes, it was a reporter there, yes. Okay. And also the prosecutor was present, correct? Yes. And the prosecutor could ask you any questions that the prosecutor wanted, correct? I believe so. And you've been through that process numerous times. Just that wasn't your first deposition in 15 years, correct? No, sir. And then what happens is then the transcription is made, and you can read through it, correct? Yes, sir. And you've probably read through that in preparation for your direct examination, correct? Yes, I have. And you met with the prosecutor before you testified, correct? Yes, sir. And you discussed what your testimony would be, correct? Yes, sir. Not that there's anything improper about that, but that was done as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. And did you refresh your recollection by looking over the deposition again, knowing that I would be cross-examining you? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. If I heard you correctly on Friday, you indicated that you've been serving this community as a law enforcement officer for 15 years, correct? Uh, it's 17 now, sir. 17? Yes. Okay. And you are a school resource officer, correct? Yes, sir. And just like my client, you work at a high school, correct? Yes, sir. And that was uh, a high school of how many people? We're up to 3,000 students. Are you the only school resource officer at that school? No, there's two of us. How long have you been at that particular school? Since the summer of 2018. And have there always been three SROs for, how many students did you say again? 3,000. 3,000. Has there, there always been three of them? No, it's me and another officer. Okay. Now, you work for Carl Springs Police Department, correct? Yes, I do, sir. And that is separate from Broward Sheriff's Office, correct? Yes, it is. You guys have completely different radio systems, correct? Yes, we do. And what you say into your radio, you know, wouldn't necessarily go to BSO officers, correct? I would not know that, no. And conversely, when BSO, when any of those officers speak into their radios, that wouldn't be coming across your radio system, correct? No, sir. The only way that that occurs is when the radios are patched, correct? That is correct. Tell the jurors what you understand patching to mean. Um, patching is um, something that's done through dispatch. Um, I don't really have that much knowledge on it. The only thing I can tell you is usually in large multi-agency uh, situations, they will patch the radios so everybody um, can hear each other. And you expected, because this was such a major event, that like previous major events, it, the radios would have been patched, correct? Yes, sir. You later learned at some point that they were not patched, correct? Um, way later. I got gotcha. you. Monitoring your radio is not something that they tell you in the academy is like optional, correct? No. You're supposed to constantly monitor your radio because you'll be held accountable for whatever dispatch is saying, correct? Yes, sir. And what fellow officers are saying as well, correct? Yes, sir. And especially when you're reporting to the scene of an active shooting, you're going to pay particularly close attention to your radio, correct? Yes, sir. Because you're getting real-time intelligence that could be critical to your life when you're showing up at a scene, correct? Yes, sir. 
So on your way to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School that horrible afternoon, you would have then, as you're monitoring your radio, heard dispatch announce at 2.26.31 to Coral Springs officers, there is an active shooter working at Douglas, multiple gunshots being fired. Do you remember hearing that? Yes, sir. You also heard Sergeant Bill Reed inquire as to whether there was an active shooter at Douglas High School, correct? Yes, sir. And then dispatch confirms right after he inquires, yes, shooting confirmed. We're getting phone calls now. Our 911 lines are blowing up. You heard all that, correct? Yes, sir. And you knew that before you even arrived at the school, correct? Yes, sir. What you didn't know when you arrived is how many shooter or shooters there were on campus, correct? I did not know. Tell the jurors what the plus one rule is and how you're trained in the plus one rule, please. Okay. Anytime you respond to an active shooter, um, there can always be more than one shooter. If you find one shooter on scene, you're going to have to maybe expect there's another one and so on and so forth, three to four. So... So you remember thinking that as you're arriving on campus, even if you might have heard about one, you're constantly thinking there could be more, correct? Yes, sir. And when you arrived, you did not know precisely where the shooter or shooters were located, correct? I did not know. When you arrive, you called to dispatch to get your arrival time, correct? No, sir, I'm confused. Were you told by dispatch that your arrival time was 2.27? I called on the phone the following day to write my report. Okay. Yes, sir. And you learned that your arrival time was 2.27, correct? Yes, sir. That would have been 35 seconds before the shooter stopped firing, correct? Yes, but may I explain? Okay. Okay. Um, when the call came out, when Sergeant Bill Reed said that there was, uh, asked if there was an active shooter, um, then the dispatcher confirmed. That's when I turned on my lights and sirens. And I said that I was, I wanted to say 97 the area, but instead I just said 97. We're allowed to say 97 the area, which means we're close by. I was about maybe a mile and a half away from the school. Okay. So you arrive at the school and you're armed with both a handgun and an M4 rifle, correct? Yes, sir. Which were you holding in your hands? The M4 rifle. Why did you choose the M4 rifle as opposed to the, the pistol or the handgun? It's a way more powerful gun and I can shoot it from a long distance. It would be more beneficial to you in an active shooter situation than a mere firearm, correct? That is correct. When you're at your school, and the name of your school is, what's it called? Coral Glades High School. Coral Glades High School. When you're at Coral Glades High School, do you walk around with the M4 rifle? I do not, sir. Are you even allowed to walk around with that big rifle? No, sir. The school? How come? Um, it's just intimidating to the children. So what we do is we have a gun safe in my office where we keep the N4 um, on campus. And some SROs will keep it in their car, correct? Yes, sir. And were you wearing a bulletproof vest that day? I was. I was wearing my normal police uniform. Do you usually wear your vest while you're on campus? All the time, sir. Okay. And when you arrived, was it pandemonium because kids were running around and there's gunfire everywhere, or was it just the opposite? It was the opposite, sir. How would you describe it to the jury when you get there? It was very... 227. It was very eerie. Um... When I got out of my car to load up my rifle, I looked west to see if there was anybody uh, running or that I could talk to to get information. I was also listening for gunfire, and I did not see any um, people on campus. I did not hear any gunfire. It was just silent. Would, would it be fair that you've characterized it like a ghost town when you arrived? Yes, sir. Now, the first person that you encounter when you arrive on campus 
is campus monitor Andrew Medina. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And Medina gives you some real-time intelligence, correct? Yes, he does. He tells you that we are looking for a white male, correct? Yes. In a burgundy shirt. A burgundy ROTC uniform shirt. Black pants. Yes, sir. And then he specifies that he was last seen around the three-story building. Correct. Also known as the 1200 building, correct? That is correct. And then he also tells you, or possibly the northeast parking lot, correct? Correct. You thought that information was so significant that you immediately then broadcast it on your Coral Springs radio, correct? Yes, sir. And you announce at 2-28-35, you recall saying, white male with ROTC uniform, burgundy shirt, correct? Correct. And then dispatch repeats, white male, ROTC uniform, burgundy shirt, correct? Correct. And then at 229, literally 25 seconds later, you announce last seen in the three-story building, north parking lot. Yes, sir. I want to understand what you meant in that moment with that statement, because you agree that in the three-story building, when you say last seen in the three-story building, is different than north parking lot, correct? They're two separate um, places on campus, sir. Okay. So when you say last seen in three-story building, north parking lot, you're actually referring to two different locations, correct? Yes, sir. So last seen in the three-story building means last seen inside that building, correct? Yes, sir. And then north parking lot would have been by the 1200 building, correct? Yes, sir. So by or inside, correct? I wanted to use the um, three-story building as my reference of go-to for everyone. Is it fair to say, though, that you were essentially saying that it's either by or inside the 1200 building, correct? Um, like I said, I was using it as a reference, but um, it could be correct. Is it fair to say that Medina was not certain of the exact location of the shooter or shooters, correct? He was not. He only knew a general area. Correct? Yes, sir. You didn't know at that moment whether he ever transmitted that information over the school radio so that my client could hear that, correct? I didn't know that. And nor did you order Medina, and this is non-judgment. None of what I'm saying is judgmental. I'm just asking you factually. You never ordered Medina to then get on the school radio and announce that information, correct? I did not. And you certainly never conveyed all that information to my client at any point, correct? I did not. Then 45 seconds after your transmission at 2.29.47, you heard dispatch announce. Dispatch advises that there are three victims down in room 1216 in the freshman building. You heard that, correct? I did not, sir. You don't dispute that that came over the Carl Springs Police Radio, correct? At the time, um, I was under high stress adrenaline, actively looking for um, a you know, possible shooter in the, uh, in the parking lot. So I may not have caught everything that was on the radio, sir. At 2.31, 31, you announce over your radio, I am on the east side of the three-story building near the parking lot with my long gun, correct? Yes, sir. Why is it important for you to tell your fellow officers where you're located? So there's not officer on uh, officer fire, and it also gives them another reference of uh, where to respond. So when an officer announces on their police radio, 1200 building or parking lot or giving a location, they're being of service to their fellow officers, correct? Yes, sir. To better serve the very children that they're there to assist, correct? Yes, sir and faculty and staff, correct? Yes, sir. You immediately continue in that 23131 transcript. You say, I will let you know where it is. It's the three-story- no, no objection here, sir. Yeah, that's the thing. Do you recall getting on your police radio and saying the following? I will let you know where it is. It's the three-story building at the northeast corner. It's considered the freshman building. Do you remember saying that? Um, I don't remember saying that, but 
If it's on the tra uh, transcript, I must have said it. That information you never conveyed to my client, correct? I did not. It went out over your radio, Coral Springs radio, which you believed was patched with BSO, correct? I had no idea if the radios were de um, patched yet. But you learn literally seven and a half minutes later at 2.39.18 when dispatch tells you, we need to get these radios patched with BSO. You heard that, right? I don't know if that's hearsay as well or not. Yeah, that's the thing. Did you or did you not hear dispatch inform you that the radios needed to be patched with BSO? Same objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that's the thing. Mr. Agosh, what you're reading from is not in evidence. So, so you can ask this witness direct questions, but I can't have you reading to the jury items that are not in evidence. Go ahead. Did you ever hear anyone inform you that we're like working two separate operations unless the radios get patched? Objection, same here, same objection. That is sustained. Did you believe if the radios were not patched that you would be working like two separate investigations? That thought never crossed my mind, sir. So Medina then drives you in a golf cart and drops you off at the northeast parking lot. Isn't that correct, sir? Yes, sir. And with all the information that you had, once you get to the parking lot, you don't run right into the 1200 building, did you, sir? No, I did not. You knew that a shooting had taken place, correct? Yes, sir. You must have known potentially that there were people that might have been harmed in the 1200 building, correct? I did not know that at the time, sir. Now, after you arrive, based on the information that you had, you had a very general idea of where you thought the shooter or shooters might have been, correct? Yes, sir. You certainly couldn't narrow it down to just the 1200 building, correct? No, sir, I could not. It included a very large area of campus, did it not? It did. So when you get there, one of the possibilities on your mind is that the shooter or shooters could have been inside the 1200 building, correct? The first thought when I got to the parking lot was to focus on the northeast parking lot. I understand. My question is, in terms of where you're narrowing it down, right? Mm -hmm. One of the possibilities in your mind is that the shooter or shooters could have possibly been inside the 1200 building, correct? Yes, sir. Also, it could have, the shooter or shooters could have been on top of the 1200 building, correct? The, the shooter or shooters could have been anywhere in that general area. I understand, but I want to break down and oh. you tell me if any of the places that I'm mentioning to you were something you completely eliminated or whether that was in the realm of possibility, okay? Okay, sir. So it, if, if you believe that the shooter or shooters could have been on top of the 1200 building, that would have included all the way west of the 1200 building, correct? Yes, sir. Could have been all the way east, closest to you, correct? Yes, sir. And could have included all the way in between as a possibility, correct? Yes, sir. And this building, if I told you it was 73 yards long, three-quarter of the football field, is that consistent with what you saw? Yes, sir, it's a big building. You also believe that the shooter or shooters could have been on any of the sides of the 1200 building, correct? Yes, sir. So it could have been on the north side, which extends 73 yards, correct? Yes, sir. South side, correct? Yes, sir. And by the way, the areas around the north and south side, correct? Yes, sir. And then the west side, which you couldn't see from your position, correct? I could not see it, correct. And let me just specify, you can identify for us. I'm showing you what is already in evidence as Defense Exhibit 1. Is this the west side of the building? That is, it's not the east side. Correct. So this was the opposite side from you, correct? Yes, sir. You couldn't see Aaron Feiss on the ground from where you were positioned, correct? I could not. but the shooter or shooters could have easily been on the west side of the building, correct? Yes, sir. And that was in your state of mind as you arrived there, correct? Yes, sir. You also couldn't rule out any of the neighboring parking lot areas, correct? I could not. 
In fact, that was actively one of the places you thought the shooter or shooters could have been located, correct? Yes, sir. If I can show you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit F, and if I can approach, show us if this is the 1200 building and this is the 1300 building. There are parking lots on the north side of those buildings. Could you include that area as where the shooter or shooters may have been located? You could. Could you also include to the right of the 1200 building, we'll call that northeast, could you include that parking lot? Yes, sir. And then you certainly could include, uh, this uh, This would be kind of, how would, how would you describe this parking lot? Because this is the one that you That's were... like the main parking lot in front of the school. Okay. Would you consider that as, a, as in play or not? I didn't at the time. Sir. Fair enough. Describe for the jurors how large these parking lot areas are. It's very large, sir. Um, it's a couple rows filled with students' cars. I believe they refer to it as the senior lot. Right. And, and I mean, this school has 3,300 kids. You're aware of that, correct? Yes, sir. This parking lot is like potentially football field large, correct? Yes. And there are numerous places that shooter or shooters could be located, correct? Yes, sir. Lots of places for them to hide because of the cars in the parking lot, correct? Yes, sir. You also, when you get to the scene, don't eliminate the possibility that the shooter or shooters could be in a neighboring building, correct? Correct. Like the 1300 building that we just looked at, that was also a complaint. You couldn't rule out the 1300 building, correct? Um, I couldn't see that from my vantage point, but it could have been a possibility, yes, sir. Which then means the courtyard area between the 12 and 1300 building was also a possibility when you approach in the parking lot, correct? Yes, sir. So this wasn't a small, restricted area that you were considering, correct? No, sir. It was very large. Would cover massively east and west, north and south, Numerous football fields as a, as a geographical area, correct? Yes, sir. With buildings and within the buildings, numerous places for someone to hide, correct? Correct. And that's why then you don't just run to a specific location, correct? Correct. Now, without question, you are trained. And I think this was your testimony on Friday. That if you have an active shooter or shooters, and you know precisely where the shooter or shooters are located, it's your responsibility to go after wherever he or she goes, correct? That is correct. But that wasn't your scenario here, correct? It was not. You did not know precisely where the shooter or shooters were located, correct? I did not. And even after listening to your radio on the way to the school, correct? Yes, sir. And even after speaking with Andrew Medina, correct? Yes, sir. And even after getting to the scene and analyzing everything, correct? Correct. And even after, we'll get to it, your chat with Deputy Peterson, correct? Yes, sir. And after continuing to monitor what you're seeing, you still didn't know precisely where the shooter or shooters were located, isn't that correct? That's correct. So you followed your training, didn't you, sir? Yes, I did. It's critical to follow how you've been trained, correct? It is. You got to the point of what we call last reference, correct? Correct. Tell the jurors what last reference is. Um, the information that uh, Campus Monitor Medina gave me was the three-story building um, or the northeast parking lot. So I gave my police department the um, reference of the three-story building as that's where we need to go. And so physically, you got to the closest parking lot area that you can get to the 1200 building, correct? Correct. And you positioned yourself literally in shouting distance from my client who was to your left, correct? That's correct. You didn't even need your radios to communicate. You could speak to him. He was so close to you, correct? We were about 40 yards apart. But no difficulty hearing what he was saying to you, correct? That's correct. And, and you were laying information to him, correct? Correct. And then what you do, once you get to the closest reference point, is you take a position of cover, do you not? I do, sir. Now, they train you not to take a wild guess and just start to run in any direction, correct? 
Correct. That wouldn't have been tactically sound in this scenario, correct? It would not have. Tell the jurors why, if you've got all these different options, you don't just say, I don't know, he could be in the 1300 building or the 1200 building or the football field or let me just start running. Why don't you do that? If there's no um, sound of gunfire and you've reached the last point of reference, there's really no reason for you to be running <clears throat> all over campus. And or what happens if you hear gunfire, but you have no idea where it's coming from? Same scenario, correct? Um, I would still res try my best to respond to the gunfire, um, maybe a little more of a tactical type of search. Um, it would be more difficult, so, but I would still make an attempt to find it, sir. I understand. Your scenario was you had no idea where to possibly go, correct? That's correct. And if that's the scenario, if you just don't know and your possibility covers football fields and football fields, what do you do? You take a tactical position of cover, don't you, sir? Correct. And that's what you did, didn't you, sir? Yes, sir. At no point did you ever believe, my goodness, we're dealing with one shooter, correct? Correct. That's inside the 1200 building, correct? Correct. Killing innocent children, correct? Correct. That's not the thought in your mind while you're taking a tactical position of cover, correct? It's not. Obviously, if you thought that, you're trained to go in, correct? Yes, sir. Now, we've been calling a position of cover and a tactical position of cover. Explain to the jurors what you call it, what you did that day. So when uh, Campus Monitor Medina let me out of the golf cart, I immediately ran to a what's called a position of cover. I used a tree trunk and uh, an SUV. I basically used the frame of the car um, to protect my body. This was a black SUV, correct? It was, sir. And using a concrete wall, for example, would provide the same type of protection, correct? Yes, sir. If there was a concrete wall, you would have gotten behind that concrete wall, correct? Yes, sir. But there was no concrete wall. You used a tree and an SUV, correct? That's correct. And you were as close as 30 yards to that 1200 building, correct? That is correct. And when you consciously chose to take a position of cover and not run in, that was a decision that you made based upon the limited information that you had, correct? Um, I stopped between the uh, tree trunk and the SUV to assess my next possible tactical move. Because you don't just go running in without thinking, correct? That's correct. Why, explain to the jurors, why you wouldn't just stand out in the open like this? We didn't know where the shooter was at. So I'm not going to risk getting shot. The smartest thing to do was to communicate to Deputy Peterson behind a tactical position of cover. Now there's a difference between cowarding and taking a tactical position of cover. That's correct. Explain to the jurors what cowarding looks like. Cowarding would be ducking, um, hiding, um, not having your gun out. Um, what was the other one, sir? The tactic, the... T taking, that would be cowarding, right? When you're not taking Correct. your gun out. Correct, I forgot what the other one was. Tactical position of cover. Okay. What does that look like? Okay, um, in this example, it would be have your gun out, um, looking around for uh, possible shooters, assessing the situation, um, talking on your radio, giving out intel. When you take your tactical position of cover, you have a visual on Scott Peterson, do you not? I do. He is off to your left, correct? That's correct. And the 1200 building's right in front of you, correct? Correct. And so you're looking at Scott Peterson, and you got a chance to look at him for at least 20 to 30 minutes, did you not, sir? I did. You could see him the entire time that you're there, is that correct, sir? That is correct. Describe the position that you see my client in. When I first arrived to the tactical position of cover, I looked to my left and I saw Deputy Peterson with his gun drawn in a low ready position. He was using the concrete column uh, as cover and he was looking east and west. Okay. Judge, with the court's permission, I'd like him to demonstrate for the jurors what he saw. 
Sure. Thank you. Could you use one of the walls, whichever you're convenient with, and and show us? Do you have? It might be one of these if, if, if it's big enough. If if this was a complete concrete wall, okay, he was in a position like this and looking like this, and then he and I were talking in this direction. Got it. So he has his gun out. In that demonstration, he's got his gun out. Yes, this is called a low ready position. Okay. And they train you to be in that position, correct? There's different positions, but this is one of them, yes. And, and I also, again, I don't, want, I don't want to supplement the record. I saw you moving your head back and forth. Is that what I saw? Yes, sir. Is that what you saw my client doing? Yes, I did. And you saw him not fixated on one particular building. You saw him looking east and west, correct? That is correct. In fact, you can sit down. Thank you, sir. Yep. In fact, you saw him, your testimony is, you saw him looking all around, correct? Uh, I didn't use the word all around. It was east and west. Okay. And you also saw him going from shoulder to shoulder, correct? That's correct. Both monitoring his radios, correct? Correct. And you're in the unique position of also being a school resource officer, like my client. Yes, I am. Correct? So you have both a police radio, correct? Correct. And a school radio, correct? That is correct. So you've had thousands of times where you're monitoring both your school and your police radio, correct? That's correct. That's not easy to do, is it? It's not. Explain to the jurors how that could be difficult. Your, like right here would be my police radio. On my uh, right shoulder, I use my school radio. Um, the police radio is given out city information and the school radio is given out the local uh, school information. So you'd have to be multitasking, correct? Correct. And then let's add another scenario. Have you also, been, have there been times in your career where you're listening to your police radio, you're listening to your school radio, and you're speaking on both? Sir, there's been times where I've said my police call number on my school radio, which doesn't apply, and I've done it vice versa. And it's worse in stressful situations, correct? Correct. But now let's add another thing. Has there ever been a time where you're listening on your, your school radio, and you're listening to your police radio, and you're talking on both, but you're also trying to pay attention to what's going on in front of you. That would be multitasking. It would be pretty hard, difficult. Tell the jurors how things are going to be setting you up for failure in that scenario. Your attention would be taken away from the threat that's out there, uh, possibly in front of you or around you. It's also what we call divided attention, correct? Correct. DUI officers are trained to ensure that people are not driving drunk and having divided attention, correct? That is correct. Because of having divided attention, you can miss transmissions, correct? That is correct. In fact, that happened to you. That was the explanation you offered earlier as to why you missed three kids being down in classroom 1216, correct? That's correct. You can miss things that are all going on in front of you, correct? Correct. You can miss both school and police transmissions, correct? Correct. And you can even say things not exactly as you intended because you've got divided attention, correct? Correct. So I want to return to when you take a position of cover, correct? Correct. You don't go into the 1200 building, correct? That's correct. Now, you know at that point when you're doing that, the shooting had just finished and that there could be kids bleeding out, correct? Uh, that was a possibility, yes, sir. But I did not know what was going on inside the building at the time. But one of the possibilities is that kids could be bleeding out, correct? That's correct. And you made a choice not to go in. And I don't say this with judgment. I'm just getting facts, judgment okay? Judgment object to counsel's testimony. Yeah, that's his thing. Go ahead. Ask your next question. Factually, though, knowing that kids could potentially be, be bleeding out, you made the choice to stay covered, correct? Based upon the information that I received from Deputy Peterson, factored into why I stayed in a tactical position of cover. Let's talk about that then. Okay. So you're in a position of cover. You want to know what my client knows, correct? Correct. And that factored into your decision making, correct? Correct. And you've known, you've known Scott for years, correct? I've known him for seven years. As far as you know, he's never lied to you, correct? That's correct. Honorable officer, correct? Yes, sir. Decent, dedicated, correct? Objection is irrelevant, sir. 
No, that's overruled. Go ahead, sir. You can answer the you question. You can answer that. Uh, yes, he had a good track record. Okay. And you, you worked investigations and things together too, correct? We did. Drug cases, correct? Uh, mostly gang activity with some drug cases, yes. No issues ever with him cowarding, correct? No, sir. Or him being a liar to you, correct? No, sir. Just the opposite, correct? That's correct. So when my client shares with you in real time, when you get there, and you say, hey, what's up, what do we got? And my client tells you he hasn't heard gunfire in a few minutes. That's correct. You believe that, correct? Correct. And that was your understanding, too, because you hadn't heard gunfire in the couple of minutes that it took you to get to where you were. Correct? That is correct. He also then, number two, he makes it very clear to you that he doesn't know the precise location of the shooter or shooters, correct? That's correct. Now, when he said that to you, did you think he was lying to you? No, sir. You believed it, correct? I did. The manner in which he said it, the words that he used, and the energy that he put behind it, you absolutely believed it to the core, correct? Yes, sir. And the other thing he tells you as you're facing him, correct? Correct. He says, watch your back. The shooter may be hiding behind you in the parking lot, correct? That's correct. So he, you believed he genuinely was looking out for you, correct? I did. And you also genuinely believe that the shooter, if you can show us where he's referencing, if you could stand up, please. Show us approximately where you were positioned and then which parking lot he's referring to. Deputy Peterson is right here. Okay. I am. That would be between the corner of the 7 and 800 building, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm just going to say this is. I am right here by the uh, tree okay. and the SUV, so we're communicating back and forth. Uh huh. So there's somebody could be hiding in this entire area right here based on his intel. And this lot right here is huge, correct? It's very big. Like football field huge, correct? Yeah, just an answer, Your Honor. That's the same. Okay, you can have a seat. And you thought that he was being of assistance to you, correct, when he said that? Yes, correct? sir. And at no point did you think that he was making that up. You believed it, correct? That's correct. And in that parking lot, you, did you look, did you, when he said that, did you take another glance behind you? Did you look? I immediately turned around mm -hmm. and I grabbed my rifle and immediately started to scan the parking lot. Um, I also stood up on the curb to make myself taller so I could see over everything. And in your mind, especially when you're getting that real-time intelligence from my client, you're believing the shooter or shooters could be anywhere, correct? That's correct. Now, <clears throat> shortly thereafter, a team of Carl Springs officers enter on the west side of the 1200 building, correct? That's correct, but I, I did not know that at the time. That was my next question. You couldn't see, from where you and Scott were positioned, you could not see the west side door where they entered, correct? You couldn't see this. No, correct? sir. You're somewhere on the other side of this building, all the way down here. You couldn't see that they made like a six-man entry into the west side, correct? I could not see that. So you certainly didn't know to join them to go in, correct? I did not know. And did they announce over your radio, hey, we're going in. These are Coral Springs officers. Would they have announced on the radio? At the time, hey, we're going into the 1200 building. They could have, but I don't know. I didn't pick it up. So you believe it's possible that they might have announced it or not, correct? It's a possibility. But even if you did hear it, it was your determination at that moment to still not join them and stand your ground, correct? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir, based on the intel that I was provided. Because you wanted to wait till you had a few more guys to show up before you left that position of cover, correct? Correct, because at the time it was just me and Deputy Peterson on the east side of the school. And that wasn't enough for you to go searching on your own, correct? 
Correct. The feeling that I had was um, if I left my tactical position of cover, yes. that um, possibly Deputy Peterson um, could be exposed. And also I wanted to um, protect guys as they were starting to come in to the area around us. Okay. So let's talk about that. Now you do see a group of officers start to go in on the east side of the 1200 building, correct? Correct. For sure you saw those officers, correct? I did. And then you did not leave your position of cover to go join them to go in, isn't that correct? That's correct. I wanted to join them, but again, if I would have left my position of tactical cover, the parking lot still would um, be unsecure. You even told Scott that a search team of guys were coming. They were on their way to join you and Scott, correct? I did, because from his view vantage point, he couldn't see them coming in as a stack. And even as these officers are entering the east side, you're consciously believing that there could be gunfire that could be coming from another area that could cause that entry team harm, correct? Yeah, it was my concern that um, it was a possibility that somebody could pop up and start shooting. You would describe this situation as very fluid, correct? Um, I just dealt with the situations as it was going on. In other words, your level of awareness changes based upon the information that you receive, correct? That is correct, sir. Now, you're aware that during the shooting, since you were very close to my client, that he ordered the assistant principal to go in to watch surveillance video to find out where the shooter or shooters were located, correct? I did not know that. You did hear my client yelling things that were being relayed to him, correct? I don't recall Deputy Peterson ever telling anyone to review video. Fair enough. Do you hear him saying the shooter may be on the second or third floor? I never heard that, sir. Okay. Certainly that information could not be ascertained by you by looking at the building, correct? That's correct. I mean, you can't see in the windows, correct? I could not. You do know that somebody's watching a video because you hear someone say, hey, we're watching video. He's in the building. Objection. You, you did hear that. Sarah. Yeah, that's sustained. At any point, did it become aware to you? Did it become known to you that he was in the building? Yes. Uh, somebody on the radio said we're reviewing real-time footage that he's in the building. And so even when you hear that he's in the building, you do not leave your position of cover to go in the building, correct? At that time, there were already um, a lot of officers going in the building. So from where I was, I took a different position of cover. So when you learn and you hear someone say, we're watching video, he's in the building, that's when in your mind you're going, goodness, I could be facing s sniper fire, correct? Yeah, it was a concern that the shooter may start firing down from the windows onto us. And you and Scott Peterson, who was standing near you, you were in the most vulnerable positions for that, correct? I was, yes. And Scott was as well, correct? Uh, he could have been. I mean, he was still by the, we're still 40 yards apart in our same positions. You referred to it earlier, but I want to go into it a little deeper about how stressful of a situation this was, correct? Correct. Not as calm as this courtroom as we're reviewing your actions, correct? Correct. Or Scott's actions, correct? Correct. Describe for them with words just how stressful it was when you got there, which would have been after the gunfire, correct? Correct. And after the students were running all around on the campus, correct? Uh, that was uh, later after this video. And would have been after the fire alarm went off, correct? I never heard any fire alarm okay. at the school, sir. So we're talking about your scenario. and Even then, you thought it was extremely stressful of a situation, right? Yes, sir. Describe for the jurors what you were feeling in that moment. Um, when I was responding to this incident, I'll go back to when I was driving my car, and they told me that this incident was happening at Douglas High School. Adrenaline immediately kicked in.
Um, when I arrived at the school and rode on the golf cart with Campus Monitor to Medina, I was starting to mentally prepare myself for a possible gun battle. And then as soon as he dropped me off in the um, north lot, I basically had another uh, bit of adrenaline. And then when uh, later on, when um, they started bringing out deceased students and I got close up with the deceased student, more adrenaline. So the adrenaline, the stress, the, um, the, the constant looking and searching and, and wondering, it, it eventually starts to, um, I mean, you're, you're, you're trained, but it starts to take its toll. In fact, you had what you describe as at least two to three adrenaline dumps at the time, correct? That's correct. I've described all of them. Okay. And while you're having an adrenaline dump, you can forget things, correct? It's called auditory exclusion. Tell the jurors about auditory exclusion. When you're so in the moment and you have adrenaline, um, there's going to be some things that you hear that are distinct and that there's going to be other things that you just, it, it's happening, but you're not hearing it. So even the sound of gunfire, as loud as it can be, auditory exclusion could cause you not to hear shots, correct? That could be correct. And also, tell the jurors about tunnel vision. Did you experience that as well? I did. So tunnel vision is kind of where, um, I'll refer to it as this, it's like HD in the center of your eyes, and then around your peripheral vision is, is foggy. So what could happen when you have tunnel vision, you're focused on something, what can happen in your periphery? You could miss something. Okay. So if you're staring, let's say, west, and let's say kids are running out of a building, you could miss someone on your periphery, correct? That's a possibility. But, and you specifically experienced that, correct? On that day? Correct? I experienced tunnel vision, correct. But some would say, well, you're tough cops. Doesn't training just eliminate all the stress that you deal with? Objection is not specified. Well, hold on. I didn't hear the question yet. What's the question? Doesn't training just eliminate all of these adrenaline dumps or auditory exclusions or tunnel vision? Doesn't just training get rid of all that? Can you answer, Judge? Well, yeah, you asked a different question. Yeah, you still have the same objection? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, sir. You may answer the question. Okay, uh, we're human beings, so we're, we're going to have those, um, those feelings. Training helps out tremendously, but like I said, we're human, and um, sometimes our uh, human emotions take over. And you experienced all of those experiences, adrenaline dump, auditory exclusion, and tunnel vision, standing just a short distance away from my client, isn't that correct? Um, it was over different periods of my entry into the school. Now, you never went into the 1200 building the entire time you were there, correct? I did not. And you did see at least a victim when a law enforcement officer asked you to assist in putting that victim on a golf cart, correct? That's correct. That was the only time you ever saw victims, correct? Um, no. After that, um, I rescued uh, two female students after that. The first time, however, that you learned that there were victims inside the 1200 building was after you left the school, correct? I don't know what you mean by that, sir. The first time that you became aware that there were victims inside the 1200 building was sometime after you left the school, and you learned that there were victims inside the 1200 building. You didn't know it when you were there, correct? Yeah, during the process of us being there, the, um, the victim toll kept mounting. So, yeah, at the end of it, I didn't know that there were 34. So, yes, I did not, uh, I, I did learn that after I left the school. Shifting gears, you're a school resource officer at Carl Glades High School, correct? Yes, sir. Before that, you were a school resource officer at Eagle Ridge Elementary, correct? Correct. Both you and Scott Peterson were school resource officers on the day of the shooting, correct? Correct. Now, a school resource officer is a police officer, correct? Correct. 
who is assigned to a school instead of working out on the street, correct? Correct. You guys train with all the other officers, correct? Correct. The training material is the same, correct? For certain things, not for our uh, agencies, mm -hmm. but for certain trainings that we would do collectively, yes. You have the same uniforms, correct? No, sir. You school reserves that have different, in, in Coral Springs, the school reserve officers have different uniforms? Well, color-wise, we're blue and BSO is green. Oh, no, I got that. Okay. I meant my Sorry. Name. No, maybe it was me. <laughs> yeah. All Coral Springs police officers who work the street have the same color uniform as the school resource officers in Coral Springs. That correct? is correct. We're dressed the same. The badges look the same, correct? Correct. Same bosses and superiors, correct? Correct. Same place that you get your checks from, correct? Correct. Now, a school resource officer is different than let's say a school monitor, a campus monitor, correct? That is correct. You have those at your high school, correct? Yes, sir. And they don't work for the police department, correct? No, they don't. They work for the school, correct? That is correct. They don't have arrest powers, correct? Correct. And they don't go to the police academy, correct? They do not. You don't work for the school system, correct? I do not. Teachers don't give you orders, correct? That's correct. Administrators don't tell you how to do your job, correct? They do not. The principal can't order you to do something. That's correct. And you have arrest powers over teachers? Correct. Administrators? Correct. Faculty? Correct. The principal? Correct. And over students, correct? Correct. Have you ever conducted criminal investigations at either of the schools that you work for? Yes, I have. You do that quite often, correct? Correct. Kids have... Give, give us some examples, just so I can use them. Uh, in the uh, public school system, we have issues with, um, with fighting um, with some weapons. Um, there's some other things. Uh, we have some uh, child abuse cases, sex cases. So those are some of the main ones. And also with drugs, correct? Uh, correct. So drugs and weapons, kids bring those to school, correct? Yes, they do. So do you ever conduct searches? Yes, sir. And searches, are you permitted to simply go up to any student on a hunch and just start searching through their pockets? No, sir. Because tell the jurors why. Um, you have to have levels of suspicion, reasonable suspicion, probable cause. You have to follow those, those levels. And do you mind if I ask you, are you a parent? I am. Okay. The Constitution doesn't prevent you from going up to your kid's pocket and putting your hand in there and taking something out if you suspect on a hunch they might have something, correct? Um, as their father, uh, I would be allowed to do that. A little different, right? Yes. Your rights as a police officer is very different than the right of yours as a parent, correct? That is correct. And you said you have 3,000 kids at Carl Glades High School, correct? Yes, sir. Do you and or the other SROs at the school ensure that all kids are properly nourished each day? I no. Think that's just relevant, Your Honor. Uh, no, that's just overruled. Go ahead, sir. You can answer the question. I have nothing to do with nourishment, sir. Do you ever assemble all the kids together and make sure that they're properly hydrated? No, sir. Do you ever bring the students into your office and stare at them physically to ensure that they don't have any bruises on them? I would only do that for a possible um, battery or child abuse case, but right. not on an everyday, no. So you're not making routine inspections on these kids to ensure that they're not suffering abuse from somewhere, correct? That's correct. That's not your job, correct? I'm sorry, repeat the question. That's not your job, correct? To ensure that every kid on that campus isn't facing possible abuse somewhere, correct? If they are facing abuse, I would investigate it. But of course. But you don't proactively look at each kid to ensure that they're free from any abuse, correct? Most of those cases come to me. Got it. Have you ever read Miranda to any students? Yes, sir. And you would say to them, you have the right to remain silent, correct? Correct. Anything you 
say can and will be used against you in a court of law, correct? Correct. And you would want them to waive Miranda so that they can then speak with you, correct? Correct. And if they speak to you and say something incriminating, you intend to put that on a report and will be used against them, correct? That's correct. After you've read, how many times have you read Miranda to students over your 15 year career as an SRO? Um, I couldn't give you a definitive number. Right, but, yeah. but a large number, correct? Correct. On any of those occasions, after reading Miranda, did you ever stop and say to the student, hold on, hold on, don't answer that question because it could adversely affect you. It could affect your future. It could cause you to get arrested. Have you ever taken that role on? Objection is to compound and counsel testifying. It's sustained as to compound. Go ahead, sir, ask your next question. After reading Miranda, did you then ever tell a student why they shouldn't answer those questions? I've never done that. <clears throat> have you ever heard the sound of gunfire outside? I have. In fact, your shooting range is outdoors, isn't it? That's correct. Are there any buildings in close proximity to the shooting range? The shooting range is in um, an industrial park, so there's some large warehouses around the vicinity of the range. Is it always possible to pinpoint the exact location of the or origination of gunfire? Um, you'll hear a very large bang and an echo. So you have echo on your range because there's buildings in the area, correct? That's correct. And what are your buildings made of? Concrete. What are the buildings made of on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Concrete. So you know firsthand that when you're shooting outdoors around concrete buildings, there could be a pronounced echo, correct? That's correct. And that could interfere with your ability to know precisely where the shots are coming from, correct? Correct, it could interfere. Do you remember Friday when you identified Scott's voice on some of the dispatch trans transmissions? I, I did. I'd like you to identify a few more, if that's okay. Okay. All right, with the state's help. Let's go to 22538 first. Your Honor, we'll need the And I'm finishing up, sir. I just have a few more areas. I think I should get it. We'll need the monitors also. Oh, you need Judge, this is audio. It has video too. Oh yeah, I just want the audio. Oh, you just want the audio. Yeah. And I, I just see one of the jurors raising their hand, Mr. Judge. Oh, do we need a restroom break? No, I was just wondering. Never mind, it wasn't on. It's fixed now. Okay. And when you're ready, you may put uh court deputy unit, tell me when the TVs are off, please. Two twenty-five thirty-eight. I want you to listen to this and tell me if you recognize the voice. Thank you, we're out. They thought it was firecrackers that went out. It's going to be the three hundred building. It's going to be uh, right off of Holmberg Road by the senior lot. That was Scott Peterson, right? Uh, correct. All right, so that wasn't the one we're going to pick. Okay. Up. That's Scott Peterson. That was Scott Peterson saying, let's get the school locked down, correct? Correct. Under the circumstances, thinking that there might have been people wandering around with guns or sniper fire, that would have been a prudent thing to order, correct? Correct. And that would have been for the benefit of the students and faculty and staff and police officers, correct? Correct. All right, 22640, please. Pardon. So I got more students running west towards the football field. UA3, we're going to Bravo. I hear shots fired. Shot. All right. Did you hear that voice saying, I hear shots fired? Yes, sir. Who did that sound like? Scott Peterson. Okay. 
And you're trained that when you hear shots fired, to announce that over your radio, correct? And not to keep that to yourself, correct? Um, in this example, I would, if I say shots fired, I better be running towards it. I understand. And that presupposes that you know where to run, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, sir. If, if you don't know where to run, I'm focused on announcing it over the radio and letting people know you're hearing additional shots. That's being of service, correct? That's correct. And that's how you're trained, correct? That's correct. Uh, 2 27 30. Shots fired, shots Make sure I have a unit over in the front of the school. Make sure nobody comes inside the school. Who said that? Make sure that nobody comes inside the school. Correct? That was Deputy Peterson. And he's further emphasizing, is he not, to keep the school locked down, correct? Correct. Which, again, you still find prudent, correct? Yes. And consistent with your training, correct? Yes, sir. 228, please. Unit to shut down Holmberg, advise. We're in front of building, and I'm trying to get open, the fence open. Building 13 and 900 building. Yeah. Alex, do not approach the 12 or 1300 building. Stay at least 500 feet away at this point. Okay, pause for a second. Who, who was that voice who said betw between the 12 and 1300 building, stay at least 500 feet away? Who, who that, said that? That was Deputy Peterson. Okay. And now 22902. Stay away from 12. Down. Next one will be 245. That voice you just heard saying, Perry, does he know where the shooter is? That was Deputy Peterson. No doubt in your mind that it's Deputy Peterson asking Perry, Deputy Perry, does he know where the shooter is? Correct. And finally, 245, please. I'd like to have 245. Thank you. Understood. You may proceed. At this point, the council wants to unseat. Seventeen Juliet three, seventeen Bravo three, seventeen Bravo four. Seventeen Juliet three. Uh, we have possible uh, could be fire touches. I think we got shots fired. Witness off. I'm going to be bringing the witness back to the CT for additional debrief. Can we get a race at a step the saw grass? On the Coral Springs side. Well, I need to come in here. 48. That's 35. We're looking for 245. Breath rate. Right. Canine 500. No canines should be tracking unless they're coming and meeting with me on the north side of the school, parking lot entrance, so we can coordinate. Repeat, no canine from any agency should be deploying unless they 56 with me on the north side of the school. 17, Bravo. We have a few of us that just went 97. Is that where you want us to uh, 56 you? 10-4, north side of the school. So we can all, all coordinate. 
coordinate our response, please. Copy. Off to the dispatch. I need the subject's name again. I'm going to talk to a student and see if I get a picture. 10 4 should be a. Thank you. Do you remember? Thank you. Did anybody talk to you about your actions? As far as any law enforcement agency ever sit you down and say, hey, tell us what happened? Uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement conducted an investigation. Do you remember who it is who you met with? Um, uh, first name Keith. I don't remember his last Does name. Riddick sound familiar? That sounds Keith familiar, Riddick. yes, sir. So you met with Inspector Keith Riddick from FDLE, did you not? I did, sir. How long after this occurred did you meet with him? I want to say it was the summer of 2018. So nobody met with you right after, like days after this occurred, correct? No, sir. Did Who was your police chief at the time? Uh, chief Tony Pastizzi. Okay. Did he ever publicly say anything negative about your actions? He did not. Yeah, that's his name. Did you ever meet with Detective Strauss from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Safety Commission? No. You mean Detective Seuss? Yes, I'm going to text him. That he did share certain things with that investigator that led to the incident. No, that's his name. Okay. It is your position today, I'll end on this. It is your position that everything that you did that day that we just talked about was consistent with your training, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor, may I just have a five minute restroom? Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, real quick five minute restroom break. Again, please don't discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else until we reach the end of the trial. I'll tell you when that is. If you leave the notepads in your chairs and step in the back for me for a real quick restroom break, I will be right back with you. Thank you.
go back on the record, this is State v. Scott Peterson, 19-7166 CF-10A. I continue to have Ms. Gomes, Mr. Killer, and Mr. Klinger present for the state. I continue to have Mr. Eyeglass present. With Mr. Peterson, who continues to be present, we are outside the presence of the jury. The witness remains on the witness stand. State, ready to proceed with your redirect examination? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Just one last one issue. Yes, sir. We were trying to find one additional audio clip, and we have just found it. One of the aliens had an identifier. Get recrossed, though. Thank you, sir. Not a problem. Okay, please bring the jury back in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Come on in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Come on in. When you are back at those same seats, you may be seated. All the parties may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you using the notepads, I'll give you a moment to get the notepads back out. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we took our quick restroom break, we had just finished the cross-examination of the witness who remains on the stand. We're now going to turn to the state's redirect examination. Mr. Kittle, when you are ready, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Burton. Good morning. Did you know that Scott Peterson was the assigned school resource officer at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? I did. And were you aware that he had a similar radio system set up with a school radio and police radio as you did? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you testified under cross-examination that you have to constantly monitor the radios, including the school radio. Is that true? Is that what you testified to? Yes. Would it be important to monitor that radio in case, for instance, the school monitor sent out a call that a crazy kid was entering the campus? That's important. How do you charge your school monitor? How do you charge your radios? It's plugged in. It's a Motorola radio, and I plug it in every night before I go home and then use it again in the morning. For the school radio, so you plug it in at night, so you don't have to charge during the day? That's correct. Is that so you can constantly monitor the radio during the day while you're on campus? Yes. Okay. Now, when you were picked up by Medina, by the campus monitor Medina, did you tell him where to go? I did not. Did he tell you where you were going? He took me where 
he wanted to go. Did you at any point in time during that cart ride ask him what was going on? Uh, I asked him what was going on right when I met him. Why did you as a police officer ask someone such as Medina that information? I needed information to give to my dispatch. Is that because it's important to gather real-time intelligence from all variety of different sources? It is. Now, you were asked on cross-examination about when you're at your high school about having a long rifle. And you stated you keep it in a gun safe in the school? We keep it in a gun safe in my office. Are you aware that some officers keep it in the trunk of their Dodge Durango that they keep in the parking lot, for instance, of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? I wouldn't know that. And with your bulletproof vest, even on campus, even when you're in Coral Ridge High School, you wear your vest at all times? Yes. Why do you do that? It's for safety, and also you never know when you're going to have to react to something. Even something that might not be on your campus? That's correct. Okay. Now, when you got to the position where Medina ultimately dropped you off on the golf cart. Um, you didn't hear any shots, did you? There was no gunfire. If you heard shots, then a different component of your training would have kicked in. Yes. What, what component of that? What do you do if you hear shots? I would immediately go to the gunfire. And why do you immediately go to the gunfire? Because that's how we're trained. Now, is your, does your training use the word precisely? Like, would you have had to have known the shots were coming from classroom one, two, three, four? No. Or just a general area? General area. And is the purpose of going towards the shots something to the tune of so you can gather additional real-time information as to, you're going? It's to eliminate the threat. So you don't stay put in a, in a position of cover for 48 minutes, correct? That's correct. Now, you, you stated on cross-examination that you, uh, you believed Scott Peterson when he told you the information when you were 40 yards apart. I did. And because you believed him, is that why you exposed your entire back to the 1200 building to stand on the curb and scope out a parking lot? I believe that the information that he was giving me was true. Is that why you stood in that position? Yes, to, yes. Based upon your friendship, your relationship for seven years? Correct. Now, then, that information was false. There was no one in the parking lot, was there? We never found anyone. So is that the wrong intelligence? Uh, it, it could have been. Um, if you possibly factor in the, the plus one rule, but if we didn't find anyone. Now you testified, you actually stood up and you said that you were looking, he was looking uh, east and west. So he had the full range of, I don't think it's that keen, right? For the record, I moved my neck from left to right. Correct. Okay. From where he was standing, would that enable him to see Is there any other events, exhibits, or just marked? Oh, it's demonstrative aids, never mind. Yeah, it's not in demonstrative aids. Go ahead. Uh, what's marked is defense tab. From the position that you were in. Yes. And the position that Mr. Peterson was in. Yes. He was standing left, which means he would be looking west towards the football field. Correct. North, straight, which would be up north, correct? Towards kind of like the east side doors. Correct. Uh, then to the east, which is the parking lot. Correct. Thank you.
Did he ever relate to you from those east side doors as he was looking north that he saw five kids run out? That was not related. Would that have been, would that fit under the category of real time intelligence? Yes. So you were asked on across multiple times as to why you didn't go in. Did you not go in because you were given intelligence, false intelligence from the defendant that the shooter could be in the parking lot? At the time, I didn't know it was false, but based on the intelligence that he gave me, um, I took a position to secure the parking lot, thinking that there possibly could be somebody in there. When you were on scene, were you aware that Mr. Peterson told fellow Fall Springs officers second or third floor of the 1200 building? I didn't hear that until later. Now, there were some questions about uh, you, you never going in. Once again, did you partake in the rescue portion of yes, I did. the rescue mission? Yes. Now, on cross-examination, Mr. Argelash asked you about responsibilities of school resource officers, that you're trained, you have similar training as other Coral Springs officers, let's just say road patrol. Do you have additional training because you're a school resource officer? Yes. What is that additional training? active shooter training. What is your job as the school resource officer at your high school? To mentor, protect, um, teach, handle crime. What do you mean by protect? Protect the students, staff. From what? From possible danger. I want to play a couple of the audio transcripts that Mr. Iglarsh uh, played for you. And if I could please get them up and ready so that we can uh, play this as well. Court Deputy Unit, all the TVs remain off, correct? If you could please go to that first one Mr. Iglesh highlighted, which I believe was um, uh, 225 38. Lockdown, gentlemen. As part of your training, if the shooting is still going on, what is the officer supposed to be doing? Going towards the gunfire. Are they supposed to be in the position? No, sir. Sir, I'm just going to object. The prosecutor is making a gesture in court that is inconsistent with the testimony. Well, the objections overruled. The jury saw what the, the witness. Again, ladies and gentlemen, what the lawyers say, I guess what the lawyers do is not evidence. Uh, the evidence comes from the witness stand right there and in the form of the exhibits over the defense objection. Go ahead, Mr. Stavisky. Mr. Stavisky, can you go back to 223 26? Okay. 
said shots fired, possible shots fired? Yes. Mr. Savitsky, could you please go to uh, 22640, approximately three minutes later? Mr. Savitsky, could you please go down to back to 22556? All right, 26. Now, we also heard it over by inside the 1200 building. Did you hear where Mr. Peterson said inside the 1200 building? Yes. Now, going to 22730. Make sure I have a unit over in the front of the school. Make sure nobody comes inside the school. Did you hear Mr. Peterson say make sure I have a unit over in front of the school? Yes. The I part of that, is that consistent with the, an incident commander or someone who's the first on scene taking control of the scene? Yes. Explain that to the jury in terms of first on scene. Do they call the shots? Yes. In an incident like this, they would call shots, and then when more police personnel show up, then the uh, admin will start taking over the bulk of the school. And is that always immediate, or does that sometimes take a, a time it period? It takes a little bit of time. So it would be almost like relieving them of command. Correct. Aaron, if you could go to 228. Building 13 and 900 building. Alex, do not approach the 12 or 1300 building. Stay at least 500 feet away at this point. Yeah, stop it there. Stay at least 500 feet away at this point. You, you testified under, well, I guess, direct and cross-examination about training. For when a shooting is occurring, what, what are you trained to do? Go towards the gunfire. Are you trained to tell other officers to stay at least 500 feet back? I am not. And if you could go to 22902. The 10 4 virus is being notified. Jerry, does he know where the shooter is? Did you ask, or did you hear where, or was that Mr. Peterson? Correct. Did you hear where he asked, does he know where the shooter is? I heard that. Okay. Now, is that something that if Mr. Peterson peeked his head into the building, looked into the building, went into the building, he would already have that real-time intelligence. Correct. So asking Perry, whether Kyle Lamont, whether he knows where the shooter is at after the shooting, that's not really real-time intelligence for the shooting, is it? No, sir. Now, there were some questions, and I understand different radio um, to use by Coral Springs and, and DSO. There were some questions about patching. Could you hear the dispatch that was just played? Yes. Now, based upon your training and experience, you, you had a rifle. Yes. Right. If you didn't have the M4, if you just had your six hour, does training prevent you from seeking out an active shooter? No, I would. You would still go in with your handgun.
But given just the inherent nature of officers responding as backup or second responding officer, how important is the information being relayed by the first officer or the incident commander? How important is that information to be accurate? Very important. Why is that? Because it dictates how the responding officers will respond to the scene. And did the information you received dictate you turning your back to the 1200 building? Yes. In your experience telling officers to stay back 500 feet, would that slow down officers responding to it, an area? It would. Now in your training, are you taught that uh, every shot fired an active shooter case could be another person getting hit? Yes. Are you, are you taught the importance of stopping bleeding? Yes. Can you just explain that to the jury? So as police officers, we're trained with uh, first aid equipment and uh, tourniquets. Tourniquets will go on um, upper extremities and also lower extremities. On uh, your chest, for a gunshot wound to the chest, we would use uh, chest seal. And are all those uh, devices utilized in order to stop people from bleeding out? I'm sorry, repeat the question. Are all those instruments, the tourniquet? The They're designed to stop bleeding, yes. Because it, it, Is that because time is of the essence? Yes. Ms. Target, I want to ask you about um, Miranda, Mirandizing students. That, that's for criminal investigation, is it not? Yes. As, as an SRO, though, you were also part of uh, administrative searches. Correct. Can you explain the difference? There? <coughs> yeah. um, Miranda would, would be where we're taking somebody to jail. A, an administrative search would be with the uh, assistance of a vice principal possibly searching uh, the book bag of a uh, student. And for an administrative search, is it a lower threshold than that utilized by police officers? It, yeah, the administrators can do reasonable suspicion. When you saw Mr. Peterson in his position of, of position of cover, was he towards the left side of the hallway or was he towards the right side of the hallway? Um, I would describe it, he was on the west side of the hallway. The west side? Yeah. Okay. Now, if the shooter was in the parking lot, would standing on the west side of the 700 hallway expose you potentially to shots? Correct. So if a shooter was actually in the parking lot, Mr. Peterson would have wanted to, would have wanted to stand on the right side of the hallway for cover. Correct. You were also asked about adrenaline dumps and uh, tunnel vision, auditory exclusion. Do, do these things completely prevent officers from doing their jobs? No. What's the purpose of training? The purpose of training is to make you the most proficient at what you're gonna do. Is it also so that if you're in these situations that you respond? Correct. And is part of training also to deal with multitasking? Uh, yes, there's some training.
trainings where is multitasking a, a part of being a law enforcement officer, being a police officer? Yes, sir. Real-time information, the real-time intelligence gathered from Medina, White Now, Burgundy, ROTC, um, was that accurate information? It was. Star Glasher asked you, he showed you the marks were made and highlighted different areas. Like the shooter could have been here, the shooter could have been here, the shooter could have been here, the shooter could have been here. In those situations, while, while the shooting is still occurring, what's the remedy to figure out where the shooter is? What are you trained to do? To go towards it and investigate. Is that to find out precisely where the shooter is? Yes. Okay, based on that, any recross? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. Officer Burton, did I hear you correctly? Did you just tell this prosecutor that the reason why you didn't go into the 1200 building is because my client told you that there could be shooter or shooters in the parking lot? Is that your testimony? Excuse me, sir? Did you or did you not just tell Mr. Killeran that the reason why you didn't go into that building at any time is because my client told you that there might be shooter or shooters behind you in the parking lot? The information that Deputy Peterson provided me, I believed at the time. That information, northeast parking lot, was given to you by Andrew Medina before you ever even made contact with my client. Isn't that correct? Yes. Medina also told you before you ever made contact with my client that the shooter or shooters were last seen around the three-story building, also known as the 1200 building, correct? That's correct. And instead of going right in, you took a position of cover, did you not? When I went to the building is when I looked to the left and Deputy Peterson provided me the information about the parking lot. Which was the same information Medina had already given to you prior to you getting in that position of cover. Yes or no? I'm sorry, repeat the question. Which was the same information that Medina had already given to you prior to you getting into that position of cover. Yes or no? I don't know, sir. You told this prosecutor that you're supposed to go towards the sounds, right? That's what the training tells you to do. Correct. When you don't know where the sounds are coming from because of a pronounced echo or for whatever reason, don't you then take a tactical position of cover and wait for more information? We are trained to go towards the gunfire. If you can't find it while you're traveling to it, slow down, you may have to gather some intel to eventually find the location. And didn't that look like exactly what my client was doing in real time? Yes or no, sir? Was this during the shooting, sir? Because I wasn't there during I'm the talking shooting. about the 20 to 30 minutes that you see him. No. Doesn't yeah. it look like he's trying to gain additional real-time intelligence? Yes. yes or no? Yes, sir, he was. And you thought he was doing that honestly, correct? At the time, sir, correct. Passionately? Correct. Yeah, that's the 
And even though Andrew Medina, prior to you getting to the scene, tells you that the shooter was last seen in the three-story building and North parking lot, you don't go in. Isn't that correct? When I show up on scene, I talk to Deputy Peterson and he provides me the information about possibly in the parking lot. Which was the same information that Medina had already given you, correct? Medina said it was a possibility in the parking lot. That's correct. And so the answer to my question is, yes, I chose not to go in. Isn't that correct? Now, Professor, the answer to my question is, I'm sorry, the answer to my question is the answer. Um, no, that, as to that objection, that's overruled, so you can answer the question. Go ahead. Okay, can you repeat the question? Still, you chose not to go in after speaking to Medina and him telling you that the shooter or shooters could be in the parking lot. You chose not to go in. Yes or no, sir? No, the, my actions were dictated on Deputy Peterson's intel, sir. Even though you claimed you were part of a rescue mission, you never went inside to help any of the kids that were inside that building. Yes or no, sir? We're trained in active shooter situations that until the shooter is found, I know it sounds harsh, but sometimes we uh, can't treat victims. So you never went inside to treat any of the victims, yes or no, sir? I did not go in the building, sir. Prosecutor asked you, you know, if Peterson had peeked in the building or looked in the building, he would have known X, Y, and Z. Do you remember him asking you those questions? I do. Same question to you, sir. Had you peeked in the building or opened up the door to look, you would have been able to see those same things. Isn't that correct? That's correct. But you chose not to leave your position of cover to do that. Isn't that correct, sir? Because I was under the assumption that based on the intel Deputy Peterson provided me, somebody was in the parking lot. Let's listen to, um, first let me just, do you remember when the prosecutor just played you um, at 225.26 and then he asked you, was that Peterson's voice saying inside the 1200 building? You do recall him saying by inside the 1200 building, correct? I don't, you have to repeat the video. L let's, let's play that one first if we could. The 225.26. By inside. Building, it's going to be uh, right off of Holmberg Road by the senior lot. Scott's voice, locking down the school, right? That's correct. Attention all units not working this signal 33. Go to Bravo Channel for regular traffic. Yeah, Some students say they thought it was firecrackers and we're not sure. By the football field. That wasn't his voice saying by the football field. Right. Firecrackers, that, right? was, that, was that was not. That was not. That was another deputy. Correct. 26. So we also heard it over by inside the 1200 building. Correct. He's not saying inside alone. He's saying by inside, correct? I believe I heard over by the 1200 building. If we can play that again. You tell me what you're saying in by inside. Crash because I went out sure. By the football field. All right, 26. So we also heard it over by inside the 1200 building. We're locking. Was that Scott Peterson's voice saying we heard it over by inside the 1200 building? That's correct. And that was your belief as well. It was by inside, correct? Meaning by, it could be in the parking lot area, because you learned that from Medina, right? Objection to counsel's testimony. Yeah, that's sustained. Ladies you? and gentlemen, let me make it clear. Uh, you all are going to decide what you hear on this exhibit as to any exhibits. Again, the lawyer's tell you is not evidence. What any witness tells you who did not hear this themselves is not evidence. You all would decide what the evidence is. Go ahead, sir. You may ask your next question. Your belief in real time was that the possibility of where the shooter or shooters might be located included both inside the 1200 building, correct? That was one of the possibilities, yes? No. It, the um, information Medina provided was 
buy the 300 building. Sorry, the 1200 building. Didn't you already testify that one of the possibilities was you thought the shooter or shooters may be inside the 1200 building, sir? Didn't you say that earlier when I crossed you? At some point, yes. And finally, can you please identify this 245? So this is 18 minutes after the shooting stopped, right? 245 would have been that. I just want you to identify whose voice this is at 245. And while he's setting that up, I think you said during cross that when you don't know where the shots are coming from, either because for whatever reason, right, you, you didn't know because you didn't hear them, or if somebody doesn't know where the shots are coming from, you take a tactical position to cover them and out in the open, correct? That's correct. And you also said you don't just start guessing. You don't just start running to try to guess when you're dealing with football fields of possibilities, correct? Objection asked. That wouldn't be tactically sound, correct, sir? Objection is asked and answered, Your Honor. That's sustained. Let's go ahead and listen to the statement. You tell me if that's Scott Peterson's voice. The only 43 I have was from Coral Springs that called in and advised he was. The only 43 was the 1200, 1300 building last time we heard the shot. Okay. Was that Scott Peterson's voice saying between the 12 and 1300 building last time we heard shots? That's correct. No doubt that was Scott Peterson's voice, correct? Yes. Thank you, sir. Opening state, is the witness excused? Yes, sir. All right, sir, you may step down. Thank you very much. While he's doing that state, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, this may call state. We will call this state. If I can have you come all the way up here to the witness stand, please. Once you reach it, but before you have a seat, if you can just stop and look at me, please. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. And once you're seated, if I can just scoot that chair all the way up as far as it will go. Can you please state your full name and spell your full name? Stacy Lapel, S-T-A-C-E-Y-L-I-P-P-E-L. -P -P -E Mr. Klinger, you may inquire. Thank you, sir. I think it's still morning, so good morning, Ms. Lapel. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing as well as I can. Okay. Could you please tell the jury um, what your occupation is? I'm a teacher. And where are you a teacher? At Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. How long have you taught at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? Um, I just finished my 11th year there. And what do you teach at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? I teach English and also creative writing. And um, where is your classroom located at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? High school. Right now? Yes. Um, in the 200 building. Was it located in a different building before? Yes. Where was it? Where was your classroom located in, uh, on February 14, 2018? The 1200 building. Okay. And on what floor in the 1200 building? The third floor. And would it be uh, at near the west end or the east end of the 1200 building? It was towards the east end. Was it the first classroom on the east end? No, I was in the second class uh, from the east end stairwell. And do you know whose classroom was the first classroom on the, was the east end of the uh, floor? Yes, it was Scott Beagle's classroom. Okay. 
on February 14, 2018, did you know who Scott Peterson was? Yes. How do you know Scott Peterson was? He was our school resource officer. Had you had much contact with Mr. Peterson? Not too much. How would you describe your, if at all, your relationship with him? Um, it was kind of a, a casual relationship. I didn't really have a lot of um, interaction with him. Um, I, I didn't see really him as a dominating force in the school from my perspective. Okay. Did you see him at all that day, the 14th of February, 2018? No, not that I recall. That afternoon, were you teaching a class around approximately 2.15 in the afternoon? I was. And what was that class about? I was teaching creative writing that day, in that class period. Okay. Do you remember approximately how many students you had? Uh, it's a very large class. Electives could have up to 40, so I had either 38 to 40. What was the, no uh, the noise level like? Very active. Um, it's normally a very interactive class. Um, and because it was Valentine's Day, we were playing music. And it was definitely an animated environment. Did something happen um, in and around between 12, I'm sorry, between 2.15 and, and maybe 2.23 or so that caught your attention? Yes. Um, we heard some popping sounds, like a succession of maybe three or four popping sounds. Um, and then a few seconds later, another succession of popping sounds. I want to, before we go any further with that, I do want to backtrack just for a second. Um, earlier in that day, mm -hmm. had there been um, any type of uh, fire drills or any code red or any type of training or anything happened earlier that day? Yes, we had a scheduled uh, fire drill. I don't remember how often we had to have them, maybe once a month, and that was a scheduled one that we knew about. We actually had meet a meeting, all departments had meetings with their administrators that morning before school started, um, just to talk about um, that we were gonna have a scheduled drill um, and just the protocol, you know, what we need to do. And I do remember that, you know, we were told uh, to kind of speed up you know, the uh, evacuation, you know, uh, because maybe we'd been a little slow before that. Okay, and could you explain to the jury, since you're on the third floor, uh, East End, uh, what, what the evacuation procedure was for your classroom? So we always have like a designated meeting spot. You know, in high school, there are thousands of students, um, and in the hallways, hundreds can accumulate. So it's impossible to like hold hands and keep track of everybody. So we know where we're, where we're supposed to go. So anytime the fire alarm goes off, um, it's just meet me at our, our place. I have an emergency folder with all my students' names in it. So then I take attendance when I get there. And everyone knows where to go. So we always exit a certain way. So we exit my classroom and we exit to the left to go down the east stairwell. And then there's a meeting location outside where you all gather? Correct. And where was that? Um, it's usually in the grassy area by Holmberg Road. And that was uh, for a situation when there was a fire alarm going off? Correct. Correct. Okay. Had you had any training or any background on what to do when there was a code red being called? Yes. Uh, we were always told to um, accumulate in the hard corner of our classroom. And a hard corner is adjacent to the hallway so that we're out of the line of sight of our door because our doors have a window in them. So anytime there's a code red, we know to lock our doors and to, and if we have time, if they have the ability to, to cover our window um, and then to go over to the hard corner. So no matter how big or how small your classroom is, you've got to get everybody over there as quickly as you can. Okay. Uh, let's return to the afternoon when you said that you had heard popping sounds, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, can you describe what happened in your classroom when those popping sounds were heard? So the first, uh, the first time we heard the popping sounds, it caused us all to pause uh, because it was an unusual sound, but nothing that sounded menacing to, to me. Um, and so we just sort of stopped and we said, you know, what is that? What's that noise? Um, and immediately I'm thinking it's 
firecrackers or balloons, which is not unheard of because it was one of those days, you know, a lot of animation in the school. Um, and so I just assumed that's what it was. Um, definitely didn't sound like gunshots to me. And when you say um, a lot happening that day, a lot of anima mm -hmm. animation, uh, that's because of sound. Right. I mean, everybody's all, you know, crazy and, you know, acting silly and, or sad, you know, depending on the situation. So um, the, the air is different when it's a holiday in, the, in school. It's not like a typical school day. And when you first heard those shots, did you know if they were coming from inside or outside the building? It sounded like it was coming from outside. So because I'm on the corner, it sounded to me like it was between the 1200 building and the 700 building, there's sort of like a, another building, I don't remember the name, uh, the name of it, it's where the auditorium is, so there's like three buildings in a row, it sounded like it was coming from that area outside. Um, and how did the students react to um, the, those popping sounds? You know, it really depended, I can tell you from my perspective, the students who were around me, I know, you know, I have to speak from what I remember, it's just that I know what some students said after, and maybe who are on the other side of the class, but my, in my vicinity, we were, they were looking at me, asking me, what do you think that is? Um, and so no one around me said, it sounds like gunshots. They were like, it sounds like somebody said balloons popping. And then I said, because then we heard it a second time. Then I said, it sounds like it's a computer cart just sort of going, being pushed over, you know, in the, on the concrete between buildings. It sounded kind of hard, you know, at that point when I heard the second one. When I was trying to, you know, kind of, understand what that noise could be. Okay. Now, um, after that, after you heard those popping sounds twice, then what happened next? The fire alarm went off. Okay, and so is this now gonna be sort of a, like what happened in the morning? Is it the same type of a, uh, situation where you'll be starting to evacuate? Yes, I mean, protocol would be the same. Um, it didn't, it wasn't surprising. We've had fire alarms go off several times in one day. So at that point when the fire alarm went off, I'm thinking there was nothing that would cause me not to evacuate. I wasn't concerned. It didn't sound, like I said, like anything menacing. So as soon as it went off, you know, I'll meet you guys over at the spot. I, sh I yelled uh, over everybody. And then um, I thought in my head, somebody pulled it um, as a joke. I was thinking maybe I should grab my keys. Maybe every, you know, told, told everybody to grab their backpacks because the end of the day, 20 minutes left in class. Um, you might, we might be dismissed by then um, after that. So then I thought maybe um, it's culinary. Culinary cooks a lot, they burn a lot. Um, so that could have set off the fire alarm. So nothing alerted me that was strange, so we just evacuated. Culinary, is that in the same building as you were or are they in a different building? They're in a different building. Right. So an alarm goes off the whole school? Like Correct. Right. The school. Mm -hmm. In the morning and in the afternoon, when that alarm goes off, uh, what exactly are your precise duties? What do you have to do, or what are you supposed to do in response to hearing an alarm? Right, get everybody out of the classroom and out of the building as quickly as possible. That's my job. And how about the doors of the classroom? How, do, how does that affect you? Uh, so you lock the doors. Um, we, we did not have automatic locking doors. So um, I open the door, kids start to leave, exit where they're supposed to exit. I wait, I hold the door open, I wait for the last kid to get out. I close the door behind me and lock it behind me. Okay. And did you do that that afternoon? Yes. Okay. After you locked the door, what happened next? I walked a couple of steps. Um, and right in front of me are all the kids. It's, it's not uncommon for there to be sort of like a log jam in front of the stairs because it's like hundreds of kids trying to get out, you know, in, in, to like sort of funnel in. So there was kind of like a, a log jam. And so I was behind um, most of the kids, all my students. There may have been students behind me from other classes. Um, but then all of a sudden I hear screaming. And then the crowd just starts to push back. So where everybody was going forward, Everything stops, I hear screaming, and then the students start pushing towards me. So I turn, um, I don't hear any gunshots yet, but everyone's running towards me, so I go to my door and open up, and then I start hearing gunshots. Now, before you had testified to the jury that you had heard popping sounds. 
Correct. Is this now a, a different type of sound? Absolutely. It's definitely gunshots. Very, very loud. Uh, very loud. Very. All right. So you now, in your mind, what does what is that telling you to do? It's telling me to get the kids in into a safe location, get my door open as soon as possible, and get them in there and get into the hard corner. Okay. So would it be fair to say at this point then you've moved from a fire alarm evacuation to a code red, uh, get everybody into a safe place in the classroom, uh, away from the door and the window. Is that yes. Accurate? Okay. So in order to to do that, what did you do? What action did you take? Opening besides unlocking my door. Well, that would be the beginning. Yes, to unlock right. the door. Right. right. So um, I'm unlocking my door. I stay at my door. I keep it open. Um, I hear the gunshots, but kids are, it's chaos at this point because kids are screaming, kids are running past me, and then just kids are going wherever they can to seek shelter. So um, I've got some of my students coming into my class, students I've never seen before come into my class. I also see them going into Scott Beagle's class. He was doing the same thing I was doing. He, we were sort of neck and neck. Like we, I don't know that he had closed his door when I closed my door, but we were definitely like right there next to each other and then shuttling kids into our class. So I'm standing there at my door um, and then I don't know at one point, but I saw the shooter come out of the stairwell and stand at the very end of the east stairwell. And, and where exactly were you when you saw this? I was at my door with my door open, my back to my door. Uh, but facing Scott and facing the shooter. All right. And so uh, Scott Beagle then is also just, I, I, if I have it right, to her reduce or your, your right? He was to my left. To your left. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, his classroom is, if I'm facing, if I'm walking out of my classroom, he's on my left. Okay. And if, it, and if you, just the reverse, you're walking in, he's Right. To the he right. would be to the right. But his back is to the shooter where I'm facing the shooter. Okay. And um, so you're both, when you first see the shooter, you're both outside the classroom? Yes. Okay. And then what happened? Um, so I remember um, lots of smoke in the hallway. Um, just, it, it was just um, very surreal. Just the shooter standing there, he's, just laying his rifle back and forth. It's just a barrage of bullets. Um, and he's shooting down the hallway. Kids are still running. Kids are still coming in. And then when I felt that it was the right time, I think I saw him walking towards us, Scott and I. Um, I turned to this side, you know, because my door is kind of open this way. And I turned to grab both handles of my door to close it, and as I'm doing that, I just remember yelling to Scott to close his door, just close your door. Um, and then I felt like a very hot, searing, you know, thing glide across my skin. It didn't really hurt, it just felt very hot. Um, and then I closed my door, I kind of hung on to the handle for just a couple of seconds because I just remember it's very hard to, you can't just like let the door close. It's not gonna just like lock shut. You have to really yank it in that building. So I kind of held on to it for a couple of seconds, and then I um, jumped over to where my students were sitting. But in the seconds that I, it took me to jump over to the students, shots came through the window of my classroom door. Let, let me stop you there just for a second. There's, in those crazy, hectic moments when the shooter is firing and you are struggling to make sure that door closes, right. What Mr. Beagle, Scott Beagle was doing? He was doing the same thing. Um, he was, I, I just remember seeing him from my peripheral um, standing there, and kids were, you know, running in just like they were running into mine. So if it wasn't my classroom they were getting into, it was his classroom. Okay. And it, um, was that your last visual of Scott Beagle? Yes. I don't, I don't really have a memory of. I only know what, because I've seen the surveillance video of my hallway, so I don't have a memory of seeing him get shot, but I did see him get shot. It's just not something that I could say that I remember happening. So, 
you get the door closed, and I believe you just said a vanilla canola goes in, so it jumps. Right. Can you explain that a little more in, in detail, how that happens? Right, so I knew, um, I knew where to go. I knew my students, I was hoping they knew where to go. Um, so as soon as I closed the door, I just knew that I needed to get from this point to this point. So that, because I knew like, I, there's a window right there and he was, the shooter was walking towards me. Um, and so it was just like immediately, as soon as I landed and I literally like took two big jumps, landed on the laps of my students and then shots just came in, like three or four shots came through my window. You actually landed on the laps of some. Yeah, I did. Um, were you able to see the shooter or or the gun when you said so the window broke? Right. No, I didn't see the gun come through the the window. Um, I don't know where he was standing, uh, but just the, I'll never forget the the feeling and the sound of the shots coming through the through the window because you almost like feel it in your chest. It's so loud. Tell where the shots are, are going toward? I didn't. I, I imagine, I, I can only assume he was trying to shoot me because he saw me through the window. Um, but I, I will never forget the bullet casings that were like in the classroom because we were sitting there for quite a while. Um, but I saw, you know, maybe three or four like um, copper colored casings on the ground along with glass. And the sound at that point was? Very, very loud. Um, so after he shot through my door, or maybe it was before he shot through my door, um, he was shooting Scott or into Scott's classroom, but there was just a lot of shooting right outside my door. Did you, since you had made that leap, you right. said that he had been outside, correct? Correct. Then explain to us what happens after the shots are fired into your classroom. So we just sit there, you know, we're quiet. We're not moving. Um, I look at the clock because I don't think this is real and I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking this can't be a drill, as crazy as that sounds, uh, because it's like the end of the school day. They would never do something like this at the end of the school day. Um, and you know, texts are coming in from my coworkers who are on the other side of the school who don't really know what's going on, um, just asking me what's going on, you know, because everybody at this point is locked down. And so I'm able to get a text out, you know, there's a shooter um, in my building on my floor. And then um, I got some text out to my family, but then it was very difficult to communicate. So students were trying to do that. They were trying to communicate. It was very, very still and quiet after, you know, the shooting. We, we heard a lot of shooting down the hallway. I don't, I yeah. Don't, I don't mean to be rude by it. Right, right. The loud shots are fired into your classroom. Right. All right. Do you hear more shots after that? Yeah, I hear a lot of shots go down the hallway. Now my window's open. It's it's just nothing in between my class and the hallway at this point. So it's very loud. I can hear everything that's happening very clearly down the hallway. So lots of shooting. I can tell that it's going down the hallway because the, the sound gets fainter and fainter, but it's still very loud. And when you say the window's open, you're, you're referring to the glass. Right, the panel of my, my classroom door. Yeah. Um, so you do hear more shots, but they do become fainter. Right. Yeah. And you took that to mean that he was going. It was going down the hallway, shooting down the hallway. Okay. Um, did there come a time when the shooting stopped? Yes. And was it again? Can you? In that crazy moment, do you have any idea? Maybe how long that was? I don't know. I want to say it was probably a little past 2.30 that the shooting stopped. I just I had my eye on the clock a lot because I just didn't, I couldn't understand what was happening. And the closer it got to the end of the school day, the more I realized how real this really was. How about you? How about your arm? What, did there come a point when you realized what that, that feeling was? It, it was, it wasn't probably until like maybe 20, 30 minutes later where it's like the, I felt a stinging on my arm and I kind of went like this and I realized that my jacket was torn and then I looked at my hand and there was blood on my hand, but I didn't, I didn't want to scare the kids so I didn't do anything, say anything. I was, I was okay. It didn't seem like anything really penetrated me. So um, I started to freak out a little bit, you know, realizing what had happened, um, but it really wasn't, I didn't really feel too much at that point.
after the shooting stopped, uh, any more sounds on the in, from the hallway that you were hearing? I heard um, a young man screaming for help um, several times. Then I heard talking, um, and we all assumed it was the shooter. You know, we we were when the student was or the young man was screaming for help. I just thought this is the shooter trying to lure us out into the hallway. So we all just stayed put. So it was very scary to hear that. You know, we didn't know what that was exactly. So you heard talking, but you you had no idea who was talking. Right. You couldn't see. Obviously, you couldn't Correct. see. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, the student, or at least the, the the voice that you heard, who was in pain, did that continue? I'm sorry, repeat that. Uh, you had said there you also heard somebody screaming in pain or in agony in the hallway. He was just screaming there. for help in Spanish and in English. Yeah. And did that continue on? I would say he probably screamed for help maybe three times. If I could, it was more than once. It's like he would scream for help and then stop and then scream for help and then stop. Did you later uh, become aware of what the, uh, the talking was? Yes, I found out later it was Anthony Borges, and he was on this phone trying to uh, call his, I think he was talking to his father or this, his mother. And he was the injured student that was right. calling for help. Mm -hmm. Do you know about how long, in, I know that this is, it's hard because it's all happening and it's a, it's a shock to be trying to take it in, but do you know how long before um, help did arrive on the floor? Um, I think it was, it was it was definitely over an hour because I remember it was around four o'clock when I was outside and I was recently outside um, and my mother had called me to see what was going on. Um, and I just remember looking at the phone and it said like 4.05 or something. So at that point, I was only outside for maybe 15 minutes. So from the time the shooting started until we were evacuated, it was probably about 3.45 when we were um, when SWAT came to get us out of our rooms. Okay, so over an hour after the shooting had started. Right. All right, when um, <clears throat> the uh, SWAT team comes onto the floor, can you describe how the evacuation of your classroom proceeded? We heard, so it was very quiet for a long time, and then we heard um, noise in the hallway and um, it seemed like it was it was police officers, but they had come to grab the young man who was in the hallway. Um, but then I just kept hearing police open up, police open up, police open up, like down the hall and then getting closer to my room. I heard some glass shattering, probably the police opening up the, uh, the doors. Um, and then we heard some commotion and I started to feel like, okay, this sounds like it's help. Um, but when he was outside our door, the, there were two SWAT officers outside our door, and I heard them say, police open up, but I didn't get up. Um, but they were easily, you know, because my window of my door was shot out, he just reached in and opened the door. And two SWAT officers came into my classroom and then told us to put our hands up, pointed their guns at us, and then um, asked if I was the teacher, and I said yes. And so then he said, everybody get up and um, don't look down. It was it at that point, or did there come a time uh, that you realized whether or not anyone was injured besides you? No, I, I didn't. It wasn't until um, my door was open and I saw Scott Beagle's body. Take your time. Till I saw his body in front of my classroom that I realized that this was really bad. Did you come to the realization that anybody else in your room, in your classroom, was injured? I didn't know because I I had I didn't not every student of mine was ended up back in my classroom because I had 38 and I think I ended up with about 20. And I had no idea where anybody ended up. So when I saw him, and then I walked out into the hallway, and it was it was a war zone. It was glass and bullet casings and dust. And then I look to my right, and then I see bodies and a lot of blood in the middle of the hallway. There comes a time later on whether you learn if anyone was injured or not from other than yourself. 
Correct. But were there any other teachers? I had two students, Meadow Pollock and Joaquin Oliver, who were my students during that class period, and they were, they were killed in the hallway. But anyone else injured, though, inside the, the 20, that you were, 20 or so that you were able to get into your room before the shooter appeared on the floor, how, how about them? Was there any of right. those that were injured? No one was injured. Okay, just so in your classroom at that time? Just at that time, injured. correct. Police officers direct, or the SWAT team direct you and your students to evacuate and go down. Uh, would I be correct in saying to the west stair? Yes. The west stairwell. So that's almost the whole length of the hall? It was, yeah. And that is when you realized that Meadow and Joaquin? Yes. I saw um, there were a couple of bodies to the left of me. There was a body in the in the um, alcove where the restroom was, and then I saw another body at the very end of the hallway, sort of sitting up and slumped over. When you exited the onto from the third floor onto the west stairwell, were there any more bodies out on that landing? No. Did you come to learn later on that there had been a body there? Yeah, I came to learn that Jamie Guttenberg was um, at the top of the stairwell, but she was moved. I want to just try to remember if I can just show you what is in Martha's case. You, it's a thumb drive, and did you have an opportunity this morning to review yes. the thumb drive? All right, there's a fairly accurate representative uh, and depict what happened that afternoon. Yes. Right. At this time, Judge, I'd like to indicate to you that uh, we need the evidence. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Without objection, state to you for identification will now be in evidence as State's Exhibit 21. And I would like to uh, also search for it. Okay. Ms. Kruger, please back up just a little bit. Sure. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, uh, just based on some scheduling issues, we're just going to press pause on the direct examination right now. I'm going to send you to lunch a little bit earlier than I normally would and ask you to be back from lunch a little bit normally when I, early, earlier than I usually would. We're going to pause. As soon as we come back from the lunch break, we're going to conclude the direct examination of the witness. We're then going to have the cross-examination of the witness, redirect and recross as needed, and then we'll proceed with the state's presentation. So with the same admonition as always, Please do not discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else till we reach the end of the case. I'm going to ask you to please be back in the jury room at 1.30 p.m., 1.30 p.m., okay? Have a good lunch.
Okay, we're outside the presence of the jury. Everyone can be seated. State, anything you need to address before we recess for the lunch break? No, Your Honor. Defense, anything you need to address? Okay. Okay. So, ma'am, you can talk to anyone you want about anything you want. It's not about your testimony in this case. Okay. And then you may step down, have a nice lunch. I'll see you right back there at 1.30 p.m. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so then we'll otherwise be in recess until 1.30 p.m.
back on the record. This is State versus Scott Peterson, 1971-660 at 10A. I have Ms. Gomes, Mr. Kilburn, Mr. Klinger present for the state. I have Mr. Agosh present and Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson likewise is present. We are outside the presence of the jury. State anything you need me to do before we get the witness back on the witness stand and resume with your direct examination. You know, sir, I just wanted to alert you and the defense. Um, for instance, you want me to put the witness back on the stand, there's going to be a video shown shortly later. Then I'm going to introduce a composite of photographs that will be next. And then after that, um, there will be another video which is already in evidence from another witness. I am going to play all but the last 11 seconds of that video. Um, and then I'm going to ask when the um, witness is up to court, we can play a part of that or a show of that last video. Does that make sense? Okay. And Again, that's only for the view of the jury and the attorneys and myself. Yes, yeah, and I just wanted you to know ahead of time. Yeah, I understand. So, so state, the last I got, uh, you for identification, the defense had no objection, but I don't think it actually was moved into evidence in front of the jury. Yeah. 21? It is Exhibit 21? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay, State, I appreciate you giving me the heads up. Anything else before we get you home? No. Can I get the witness back on the witness stand, please? Defense, anything else you need me to address before we get you home? No, thank you. Okay. Witness 21. You for identification became State 21. And what was it? The video that had oh, not okay. been used. And once you're seated, if I can get you to scoot that chair all the way up. You're still under oath from this morning. Okay. Please bring the jury back in.
at stage 21. So, Mr. Quibble, if you could please play that for us. And this would, yeah, this would not be. Yeah, court deputy, none of those allegations are on, correct? Correct. Oh, shit. Bro, what the? I know you. <laughs> I know you guys hear me. Now I'm going behind the cover. It's not like somebody in the bathroom. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, That was um, probably around two, like a little after 2.20. So that was after we heard the first set of like popping sounds. So we heard them, we sort of stopped for a second trying to figure out what it was. And then um, I think it was like right, right before, I think during that video, the second set of popping sounds were happening. I think I couldn't hear it in the video, but I just remember that the first set kind of caused us to pause, you yeah. know? And then um, we heard a noise that, uh, that elicited some screams from students. That, right. That noise. Yeah. Um, well, the noise, the noise, it was the, um, the fire alarm, the alert that went off. And I think everybody was just sort of on edge in that moment, like right before the fire alarm mm -hmm. went off. Uh, because we were trying to figure out what the noise was. So the fact the fire alarm went off and it's so loud, it's so piercing that it just sort of jolts you every time it goes off. You know, I just remember being in that building, anytime the fire alarm would go off, it just sort of startles you, you know? So I think everyone was sort of on edge. And then I think that's why everybody was screaming. Okay. And um, do, you, do you recall or not whether or not that fire alarm went off uh, or shut off uh, after coming on? It was, it stayed on for, I don't know how long, maybe a minute, 45 seconds a minute, which is also unusual because normally it would, it would go on for a while, but the alarm was going off as we were uh, evacuating the classroom. And it, I don't remember when it went off. Uh, I don't remember if I heard gunshots and the alarm at the same time. Well, let me ask you that, just a, a quick question about normal procedure. Uh, if that alarm goes off, is it normal procedure to immediately start evacuating or do you wait for uh, anything to come over? Do no. you have a PA system? We do have a PA system, but the protocol then was exit immediately. Okay. Don't, there was never an announcement, ever. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, let me ask you further. Did you ever hear an announcement come over any the speaker of a code red that day? No. Please take a look at what's been marked as states B and tell me if you recognize that diagram. Yeah, that's the, um, the diagram of the third floor of the 1200 building. Okay, and your classroom number again was? 1255. All right, and does that accurately and fairly depict uh, the diagram accurately, accurately and fairly depict the layout of the, 12, the third floor of the 1200 building? Yes. Okay. Judge, at this time, the state would ask to remove state B into evidence. Any objection? No objection. Without objection, states B for identification will now be in evidence at a state's exhibit 22. And if the court elected to uh, use the Elmo to publish, there's nothing sensitive. The TVs can be on for this. Yes. Okay. Um, Judge, would you mind if we put on the pencil and the, the marker, please?
No problem. No problem. Um, Ms. Lapel, again, I, you just said a few moments ago it was class in 1255, so I'm going to use my finger here and point to 1255. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And would um, Mr. Beagle's classroom be 1256? Yes. Right next door? All right. And this, as you see over here, would be the east stairwell? Yes. All right. And coming over here to this side, this would be the west stairwell? Yes. Do you know what, what, what's in this area right up above my finger there? That's the teacher's lounge. Okay. And um, with the numbering, can you tell, is, is there a number assigned to where the bathrooms are? Oh, for the, the students' restrooms? Yeah, yeah. 1247 and 1248. Okay, those are the rest, um, and I'll try to use my finger here. Okay, 1247 and 1248, those would be... Uh, the restrooms? Yes. And um, do you remember when you were evacuating, you said that you did see um, a meadow and another girl uh, lying on the ground. Where on this photograph uh, or on this um, depiction that would have been? Yes, they were in front of 1249 and 1250. Okay, so in... Here in this in the in the alcove in the uh, that's between, there's a little partition there. Okay, and um, I believe you also said that you saw Joaquin. Yes. And where was where the where was Joaquin? In 1247. Okay, the men's room 1247. Yes. Over here. All right. I believe you also said you saw Peter Wang. Where yes, was he was at the very end. Of the um, of the hallway, all the way on the west side, okay. against the wall. So would that sort of be between the entrance to the teachers' lounge and the entrance to the uh, west stairwell? Yes. And if I am I pointing in basically That's correct. the right yes. direction? Okay. Um, I believe you also testified earlier that um, Jamie Guttenberg. Uh, you found out later she had been moved, but at one point she was, do you remember where? She was like where 1200A is. Okay. From what, I, I didn't see it, I didn't see her, but I, I, am, I heard that that's where she was. On the landing, sort of out? Correct. Out here, landing, okay, thank you. Judge, may I approach the witness? You may. Um, Ms. Lapel, I want to show you what's been marked as State's W for identification. Um, this is a composite of six pictures. Could you just to yourself quickly look through them and see if you recognize that these are the pictures you looked at earlier today? Yes. And do you recognize every one of those pictures? I do. Do they fairly and accurately represent the people that are in those pictures? Yes. And you know who those persons are? Yes. At this time, Judge, I'd like to move State's composite um, W into evidence. Any objection? No objection. Without objection, State's W for identification will now be in evidence. That is State's Exhibit 23, a composite exhibit of six photos. And with the court's permission, I would like to call those through. You may. Thank you. Uh, 
Ms. Sitar, can you please tell us um, what we're looking at in this photograph? That is Meadow Pollock. And was Meadow one of your students? She was. And it, you already stated that you saw her at the end, uh, after the incident. I did. Yes. Do you recognize the photograph that is currently being displayed? That's Peter Wang. And um, Peter was the one you just told the, the jury a few moments ago was at the end of the hallway between the teacher's lounge and the uh, doors to the west stairwell. Yes. He had been shot. Did yes. You, where? Yes. Do you recognize um, the person depicted in this picture? That's Kara Loughran. And um, again, um, did you see Kara Loughran after you left your classroom? I did. And was, had she been shot? Yes. Ms. Sokol, do you recognize the person in this photograph. That's Jamie Guttenberg. Okay, and we went through that, that you did not see her, that you had learned later on that she was on the landing of the floor west stairwell. Correct. Do you recognize the person in this picture? That's Scott Beagle. And um, he was the teacher in the classroom next door, correct? Yes. And you saw that he had been hit by gunfire when he left? Yes, the I did. And I have one last photo. recognize who's in that photograph. That's Joaquin Oliver. Is Joaquin in your class? Yes. As was Meadow? Correct. And you saw Joaquin when you left your classroom? I did. And he had been shot? Yes. Judge, at this time, I do have, would like to show the witness what is already in evidence as state six is the composite and it would be sir f4 from that composite you want to play f4 of states exhibit six which is the camera labeled number 23 yes sir. is that correct okay you may proceed thank you oh and this yeah this would be some good time. understood court deputy units please let me know when all the tvs are You may proceed. So that, that yellow uh, circle, is that going around in you, where you are located? Yes, that's me. <coughs> Thank you.
and that very last scene um, that you and it just opposite from you is Scott Beagle. Yes. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask, um, the photographs that I showed you earlier, the live photographs of the six people, uh, they were all on the third floor, correct? Correct. Okay, cross-examination, you may proceed. I'm so sorry that you went through this trauma. I'm going to try to get you off as quickly as possible. The sounds that you heard were muffled, popping sounds, correct? Correct. At no point did you or anyone around you seem to think these were gunfire shots, correct? No one around me directly, correct. And that was the first round of gunfire that you hear, correct? You felt they were muffled, popping sounds? It sounded like popping sounds, like balloons popping or firecrackers. And the other example you gave was like a cart going over cement? Yes. Okay. But definitely not gunfire, correct? Would not be a context for me at that moment. And you believe that those shots were coming from outside of yes. the 1200 building, correct? That is correct. And you believed that it was between somewhere the 1200 building and the 700 building outside, correct? That's what I thought. And then the second round of gunfire occurred, correct? The second popping sounds, I assumed, was coming from the same location. And it was the same type of muffled popping sound, yes. correct? Yes. Not like gunfire, correct? That's correct. And you also believe that it wasn't coming from inside the 1200 building, but outside the 1200 building, correct? Yes. And you even thought that it was coming from somewhere between the 700 building and the 1200 building, outside, correct? Yes. You never obviously would have let your students go onto the third floor and evacuate onto the third floor if you thought that there was a shooter in the building, correct? Of course not. And one final question. When you left your room for the fire alarm, you brought your keys with you, correct? I did. They were around my neck. You're trained to bring your keys out of your classroom and not leave them inside. Correct? It's not really part of training. We have lanyards with keys, and standard procedure is we wear them around our necks. Some teachers wear them in their pockets. But you definitely bring them outside the classroom, or else your kids won't be able to get back into the classroom if you have to go back in, correct? Correct. Okay. I, I thank you for two decades of service for our children. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Based on that, we redirect. No. Is the witness excused? No. You may step down. Thank, Thank you. you very much. While she is doing that, State, you may call your next witness. You want to play the end of F3 of State 6 that you just paused with the witness uh, present? Yes, sir. F4. Four. Four. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead.
Sir, if I could have you come all the way up here to the witness stand, please. Once you reach it, but before you have a seat, if you can just stop and look at me for Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do, sir. Please be seated. And sir, once you're seated, if I can get you to scoot that chair all the way up as far as it will go. Can you please state your full name and spell your full name? <clears throat> Detective Brett Schroy, B-R-E-T-T. -T. Last name is S-C-H-R-O-Y. Mr. Cleaner, you may inquire. Thank you, sir. Uh, Detective, can you please tell the jury what you do for a living? Uh, I'm a detective with Coral Springs Police Department. I typically handle financial crimes. How long have you been with Coral Springs Police Department? Just short of 14 years. Did you have any uh, prior law enforcement service prior to uh, joining Coral Springs? I did not. Did you have any prior military service? I did. Uh, seven years, uh, both as an enlisted man as, and as an officer. All right. And when you left the service, what, what was your title? Uh, first Lieutenant. Uh, let me call your attention to the afternoon of February 14, 2018, um, approximately 2, 2.15 in the afternoon, maybe a little bit later, right in that time. What were you doing? I was on the second floor of the Coral Springs Police Department in the Detective Bureau. And could you tell us or give us an estimate of how far away the Coral Springs Police Department is from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? I would say probably three to four miles. Were you there by yourself or you uh, we all have our own separate cubicles, but there was probably a dozen detectives that were in the room at the time. And um, while you were there in the room that afternoon, did anything unusual happen? Uh, a call came out over the radio. It was very benign the way it came out. It was almost like everybody at once stood up in their cubicle and said, wait a minute, what? What, what did they just say? So it was, uh, it was very surreal. What did, what did that call cause you to do? Um, that call, um, first of all, Detective Pena, who sits in the cubicle next to me, knowing that my son, uh, that my son attended, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas said, dude, active shooter at Stoneman Douglas. And I don't, particularly remember how I got down several flights of stairs in, into my vehicle. And that, that came over the, uh, your uh, radio, your dispatch? It came through Coral Springs Dispatch, yes. Let me ask you, I, I know it's difficult. Did you know where, at that point, where your son was in high school? No. Um, building numbers or anything of that nature would not have meant anything to me at that point. Uh, I certainly didn't have my son's schedule memorized, um, so I, I wouldn't have known if he was in the 1200 building or any other building. And you know, was he a freshman or a sophomore or a junior? He was in his 10th grade year. Sophomore? Yeah. So when you got downstairs, what, what, did, you, what did you do then? Uh, I jumped immediately into my car. Some other people were donning their vests, getting their rifles out. Um, I wanted to get there as quickly as I could. Uh, so I just jumped in the car and I went. So um, would it be correct that you didn't, at that point, uh, put on your vest or, your, uh, or, or get your gun? No, and at that point, uh, I was a fairly new detective, and uh, often the cases, they give you the rottenest cars that have um, the guns that are in the back in a, in a hard case. So the gun was in the trunk, and my vest was on the back seat at the time. All right, let me ask you, uh, prior to being a detective, what did you do with the Coral, for the Coral, Coral Springs Police Department? I worked both in patrol and I was a bicycle officer. Have you, have you ever been an SRO? I've never been an SRO. Oh. Uh, can you tell us how, if, do you remember how long it took you to get, uh, I, you said it's about three to four miles, how long it took you to get to uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? It took several minutes to get there. Luckily, the fire department had gotten the call actually a couple minutes before we did, and it actually started to close down intersections, which allowed us to not have to wait for a green light. Uh, but as I approached the school, there were parents in the roadway, uh, cars parked in the roadway, 
it took a little bit to get around vehicles to get close to the school. Um, from your son's schedule, were you aware when school was slated to end um, during the week? What, what time school would end on a daily basis? Like uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock, somewhere in that nature. Somewhere yeah. in that area? Yeah, yeah, somewhere in that area. All right, and um, if you recall, do you know what time it was uh, when you arrived at Marjorie Stoneman Berkeley High School? Absolutely not. Um, it, it's difficult. Um, there was a lot of things going through my brain as I was driving, uh, what I was going to do, uh, whether I was going to try to go attempt to find my son, if I was going to go attempt to uh, locate the shooter and kind of address the shooter and by addressing the shooter, you know, save everybody while saving my son. So I, I wasn't thinking about time. I was just thinking about getting there, getting out, getting my equipment and addressing the threat. Going through your mind, um, was there a, a, in your mind any question as to whether you were going to save your son or whether you were going to just go after the shooter? Within a few seconds, I had determined the best course of action was to save him by saving everybody else. So, did there come a time later on that you realized about what time you had arrived at the school? I've been told. Um, I arrived about 10 minutes after the last shot. So um, at what part of the campus did you actually, uh, well, let me put it this way, excuse me, strike that. Uh, in what area of the campus did you leave your vehicle? Uh, there's a scrolling sign that's kind of the um, middle, uh, uh, let's say, southeast corner of the campus, a scrolling sign that does announcements for basketball games or dances or whatever. And that's kind of where I parked. Um, there's reasons that I did that. I saw there was uh, a large amount of vehicles that were parked on the northeast corner. I kind of assumed that's where the problem was. But as I had stated uh, at that point, I, I neither had my vest nor my rifle. All right. Uh, I'm just going to quickly show you. Defense F for identification. Excuse me, I have a recorder. Um, if you could just point sure. out for the jury, um, if you recognize, if you recognize this map, um, where you you saw you said there was a lot of traffic in one corner of the school. Yeah, the the majority of the traffic was up in here, uh, in this area. Okay, near so, Pine Island and and Holbrook. Holbrook. Okay, so. There's a scrolling sign somewhere in this neighborhood. Again, there was cars parked all over the place. It kind of limited my ability to, um, to really pick a good spot. So I just kind of rolled to a spot, jumped out, and started to get my equipment up. OK. Thank you. That's fine. All right, so when you say um, you got your equipment out, can you further explain to the jury what you're talking about? Um, we're all issued a vest. Um, as a detective, you can imagine I'm, I'm upstairs. If the cases come to me, I'm not dealing with the public. I'm not dealing with the bad guy. So our vest is kept typically inside our vehicle. When we go to a hot call, we would throw that vest on. So that vest was behind me in my back seat. Uh, I had mentioned previously, um, if you look in police cars, a lot of times the guys can grab the rifle right above them. It's in a rack. They press a button, they can pull the rifle out. Uh, because I was in an older car, my, uh, my rifle was in a lockable box, which is in the trunk of my car, so I had to get it out that way. Okay. And where was the vest located? Uh, behind me in the back seat. All right. Um, when earlier, before you became a detective, you were on road patrol and bicycle patrol, would you wear your vest all the time? 100% of the time. And why would you do that? You just never know uh, what's going to happen. So it's, it's better to have it on and not need it than to need it and not have it on. Uh, a minute ago, you said um, a hot call. Is that, am I correct? Yes. Can you explain what you mean by a hot call? Uh, one that I guess there would be an element of danger. It's, it's not uncommon for me to go and interview people without a vest. 
you know, it's kind of this calm down situation where I'm not talking to a suspect. Um, under those circumstances, I might not put on a vest, but this is certainly one that a vest is necessary. So, um, you leave your car at that location? Yes, I did. All right. And where did you go? Uh, initially, I wanted to go towards where the majority uh, of the cars had been formed up in that northeast corner. Uh, but almost immediately when I grabbed my rifle out, uh, Sergeant DeRosa, who's at that time was in uh, the detective bureau, grabbed me and said, hey, you're with me. So uh, we didn't know where the shooter was. It was his idea um, to start forming teams to start searching. In, in, in the chain of command, it's, if he's a sergeant, is he above? He is, he yes. Is. Okay. Yep. So you follow his directive? Yes, I did. And I just wanted to make sure when you say there was a lot of cars up at the northeast corner, that wasn't just police vehicles. It was a mix of vehicles? It was a mixture of uh, police cruisers from different agencies. It was unmarked cars. It was parents' cars. It was, um, it was kind of chaos in terms of people walking around in the street, uh, uh, parents, I'm sure, that were you know, upset and wanted to know what was going on with their kids. So there was just a lot of traffic. All right. Up until this point, when, when, when you uh, joined forces, so to speak, with Sergeant DeRosa, had you heard any shots being fired? At no point while I was on campus did I hear a shot fired. All right. And at that point, had I don't know if you had time to check, had you heard from your son at that point? No. I had tried multiple times mm -hmm. to get in contact with my son. Uh, when I would dial his number, it wouldn't even ring. And I, I would chalk that up to the amount of traffic and the amount of people that were trying to do the same exact thing. Okay. Where uh, do you and Sergeant DeRosa go? Initially, we tried to uh, gain access to the campus. There's a gate almost directly west uh, of where uh, I got out of my car. That was locked and chained. So we ended up going to the main, uh, the main entrance and banging on the doors, getting the attention of a deputy that was inside the administration building, and they let us in. Okay. So, that, your knowledge, that was the administration building? To my knowledge, it was, yeah. Were you aware whether that building had a number or, or not? No, and again, even to this day, I'm not sure that uh, outside of one or two buildings, I could tell you what buildings were what numbers. All right. So, what happens when you go up to the administration building? Well, we, because we didn't know where the shooter was, um, as I had mentioned, the idea was to just start clearing until we got more information. So uh, the, the, there is an auditorium that was right there. So the first thing that we did was clear the auditorium. Right, let me ask you, um, because I, I don't want you to get too confused. I'm going to put that map up again. Do you think you'd be able to identify at least from looking at the map? I think so. Oh, yeah, oh. I think so. Yeah. Do you have anything to do Again, this is uh, what's been marked as state uh, defense F for identification. Um, sorry, Madam Court Reporter. May the witness step down sure. and excuse the identification. Mm -hmm. All right, if you could just show the jury. Um, yeah, let's see if we've got this right here. This is where I came in, so. All right. Initially, we, we tried to get into a gate that was about right here. Okay. I don't know if you all can see that. I'm sure I do. Uh, was it located about here, ultimately? We came in through this area. I'm going to assume that this is the auditorium right here. Okay. And so this is where you go to clear? Yeah, this is this is the building that we ended up clearing initially. All right, great. Could you please explain to the jury what you mean by the word clear? Um, the auditorium was locked. I ran into an administrator that was outside. He was able to unlock uh, the auditorium. I stuck my head inside. I kind of looked at my hard corners. There was a bunch of students that were in the middle of the auditorium. I called out to them, has anyone seen or heard the shooter? And several of them said no. So at that point, I backed out. I had the administrator lock the door, and I physically went into the bathroom, each stall, to make sure that somebody wasn't hiding inside the bathroom. So is it fair then to say by clearing you're, you're not actually clearing people out of the building. No. You're doing what? I'm actually just asking questions. Obviously, I don't want to 
force people out of the room, out into the parking lot, or, or into some other area of the school where they might actually get shot. They're actually safer staying exactly where they were. But in, by using the word clearing, what I'm saying is clearing for the suspect. Okay, so you clear, you're, you're in your mind, these kids are safe, there's nobody in there, you start to shoot. Right. right. So after, did, was there any incident after you finished clearing the bathrooms that happened? We had received um, uh, intelligence over the radio, on the Coral Springs radio, that the subject uh, was dressed w in black pants and a red shirt. Uh, when I finished clearing the bathrooms, I noticed that there was a door that led to the theater. There's a spiral staircase that led to the top of the theater. I went to the top of the theater and a subject that was dressed in black pants and a uh, red shirt was actually hiding in the dark. Um, so I ordered them out, we took them downstairs, the person was cuffed and then escorted away from the scene and I didn't see that person again. And I, I'm presuming that while you're going and getting this person out because he's, got, he's wearing something that matches what you had heard, uh, you've got your gun out oh, yes. and being uh, extraordinarily careful and right. uh, handling that person. That's correct. Did you ever find out whether he was a suspect? Oh, obviously, it learned later on. It was just a student that was trying to hide, and that was a good place to hide. So it wasn't the person that we were looking for. But we never know. Uh, I wouldn't. You wouldn't know if you're in a situation like that and you find somebody huddled in the dark. So that's why he was uh, detained and later cleared. All right. So um, is Sergeant DeRosa still with you? He is. I don't think he came to the top of the stairs. The stairs are quite narrow. Uh, he was there when I brought the subject back down. Okay. So once the subject's taken care of, what do you and Sergeant DeRosa decide to do? Uh, while this is going on, we had also received intelligence that um, there, were, there, were wound, there were wounded subjects at the 1200 building, which really didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know what the 1200 building was, even though my son attended. But when they said the three-story building, that keyed into me. And at that point, we, uh, Sergeant DeRosa and myself, started moving down the hallway towards uh, the 1200 building. So again, I want to make sure we have this right, that even though your son attended the school, just the name, 1200 building, that didn't mean anything to you? It didn't at that point. But when you heard three stories, right. that clicked in. Right, because that's the only three-story building. I believe he also said northeast corner as part of his uh, transmission. All right. So at that point, then, you um, you begin. Uh, let me, well, let me ask you this. Uh, we talked about a little earlier that by the time you arrived at the school, the shooting had been over for, uh, let's say, 10 minutes, I believe you said? Yes. Now some more time has obviously gone by. You've cleared the auditorium and you're taking care of the suspect. How much time now do you, would you estimate has elapsed if you added on to that 10 minutes? I'd say another 10 or 12 minutes at least. Okay, so give or take 20 to 22 minutes uh, since the shooting ended. Correct. Okay. All right, so what happens next then with, uh, as, you, as you go, um, if I've got it right, north, North, We're going north basically. through the hallway, um, passing the 700 building, approaching the 1200 building that I can see across uh, a grassy area. Uh, I, in I encountered uh, the person that I knew as the SRO. I would, did not know his name, but I did recognize him. And how did you, how were you able to recognize him? From, just from attending sporting events and that type of stuff. Um, it, it wouldn't have made sense for me to ask my son, who's your SRO? You know, I'm, I'm a cop myself, um, so I just, I just recognized him from being around the area on previous sporting events. Okay, football games, whatnot. Right, right. Now, just before you said that you saw the SRO, you said I was able to see ahead. Were you able, did you have a, a clear view of the east end, well, what now is the three-story building? The yes, I did. Building? Yeah. What were you able to see, if anything, there? Uh, at that point, there was already people making entrance uh, from uh, the east end. Uh, cops were already making entrance. Students were 
were exiting the building at that point. Okay, so when you say people entering, you mean law enforcement? Law enforcement. Okay. Were you able to tell if that was a Broward Sheriff's Office or Cold Springs or a combination there? I think it was a mixture of both, yeah. Is, is there a difference in uniforms between what DSO wears and what uh, Cold Springs wears? Absolutely. Um, the gentlemen that are uh, on the side over there are dressed in BSO uniforms, which are typically dark green, whereas Coral Springs is dark blue. And today you are wearing a Coral Springs uniform? I am wearing Coral Springs uniform. Uh, and it is, as best I can tell, dark blue. Dark blue. Okay. Dark blue or black. You all take right. take your choice. All right. Um, all right, so you're able to see that uh, law enforcement is entering the building and also that students are being extracted from the building. That's correct. All right. Do you speak with... Um, now, I know you said you didn't know his name, but you knew him to be the SRO. Did you speak with the SRO at that point? I did. Um, I, ran, I ran up to him, uh, and I had to pause. I had to wait. Uh, he was either speaking on the radio or attempting to speak on the radio when I first went up to him. And let me ask you, when, uh, when you first went up to him, did you take any type of, a, a let's say, tactical decision before you... Your body. Were right. you just standing up straight, or were you doing something else? You no, know, I, I, as I recall, it was kind of like a crouched position, like, hey, I'm not really sure about walking out into this open area. I'm trying to make myself, I'm, I'm kind of tall to begin with, so I was trying to make myself a little bit smaller, not knowing where the shooter actually was. Could the officer please, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the detective step down for a moment and just show sure. the jury what type of position you were, where you were in? Uh, holding a rifle either in my right or my left hand would be kind of like this, make myself small type of, of thing just to get within earshot of him stepping out of his bush. And how tall are you, sir? 6'2". Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Now, I believe you said the reason for that was because, well, let me scratch it. Let me ask you, during that time period when you left uh, the auditorium and had secured the, the subject that you had found hiding up there, uh, until the time that you spoke with uh, the SRO, had you heard any shots go off? No, no shots. Okay. So tell us now what, what you, you had said to the, the, the SRO seemed to be very busy, correct? He seemed very busy. He seemed very agitated, obviously. Um, I waited to what I thought there was a pause, and uh, recognizing that he's the SRO, he's been there the whole time, uh, he would be the most knowledgeable about the location of the shooter. I asked very simply, where is the shooter? And did he respond? He did. He pointed at the 1200 building and said he's on the third floor. So other than what you had heard earlier, this is the first in real-time intelligence that you're receiving? Yes. Did you have any knowledge of where, obviously the SRO is telling you that, do you have any knowledge or know where that he was getting that from? Did he sell, tell you that? Uh, I, I didn't want to burden him with a bunch of questions. I okay. felt he was the most knowledgeable, so when he told me that, I took that at face value and, and backed away. Okay. So I'm, I want to make sure we have the picture clear. In your mind, from that intelligence, you are believing that there's a shooter, not necessarily firing, but a shooter inside the 1200 building on the third floor. That's correct. And you've also, as you testified, you've already seen uh, Coral Springs and maybe other uh, agencies entering from the east end of the 1200 building, correct? That's correct. All right. So what, do you, what, what then do you do? I was trying to think to myself, how can I be most useful? Uh, I knew that entry had already been made uh, to the building. Uh, about that time, uh, a radio transmission had come across Coral Springs, Maine, saying that he had shot the windows out. Um, so, who had? Who did you take that to mean? Had shot the windows. The shooter, which you know later we found out was was Cruz. But you know at that point we didn't have an, an ID on the subject. So, my assumption was that the shooter had shot out the window. Uh, Did you know windows? 
I don't mean to interrupt. I, yeah. I'm trying to get through it step by step here, and so forgive me for interrupting. But did you know where Dallas windows were that supposedly were shot out? I don't think they had said at any point, you know, the third third floor windows, second from the left, or anything like that. It was just that windows had been shot out. Okay. All right. I'm mean, again sorry to interrupt. Go yeah. ahead. What were you doing? So that? I was trying. I I was trying to think to myself, how could I be most useful? I had mentioned. You didn't want to have too many officers going into the building, uh, particularly from both sides, because you have a crossfire type of situation. Can um, you explain that just a little more? In sure. Um, if you can think about a building and there being access on both ends, if the bad guy was in the middle and did something that would uh, require us to shoot at him, we'd be uh, both sides would be shooting at the subject and, in effect, shooting at each other. So that's, that's what I mean by crossfire. Right. Needs to be avoided. Right. That needs to be avoided. Okay. And then you did what? So uh, Sergeant DeRosa and I had a quick meeting. We talked about uh, the fact that it, it's possible that he could be uh, using those windows to shoot at first responders as they're coming into the building. Uh, I looked to my south. There was... Uh, the 700 building, there was a exterior staircase. Uh, we cleared our way to the top of the staircase. My idea was I would be able to watch the building from that elevated position. If uh, the shooter was to shoot at first responders, I would be able to shoot back and uh, I'm going to keep have to him stop from you. doing that. A couple of questions lined up on um, sure. what you just said. Um, if you can tell us approximately when you go up to the second floor of the 700 building, which I'm presuming is on the north side because you're yes. on the south side of the 1200 yes. building. How far are you from the 1200 building? Uh, 30, 40 yards, maybe. Okay. And where is the SRO in relation to you when you're going up that stairwell to get up to the second floor? He's still in that same position that, that I had left him, which is kind of between the 700 building and the 1200 building. All right, but is he in a, uh, is he out in the open or is he sort of in a, a somewhat enclosed area? He's in the open. It, it kind of struck me strange that he was not adopting that same idea that I was, that it was kind of bent over as I made movements to try to make myself small. Uh, you, you testified that you've seen the SRO at, at, at football games. Um, is he a tall gentleman? I'd say he's at least as tall as I am. All right. And um, can you describe as far as his physical position? So, you know, whether he, you just said, was he bent sort of down like you were? Yeah. Was he standing up straight? He was. The whole time? Yes. Uh, did he have his gun um, out or drawn? As I recall, he, he did have his pistol out and had a radio in the other hand. And do you recall what type of uh, pistol that was? I believe that BSOs issued Glocks, I believe. So you get up to the, you climb up to the second level of the 700 building, or the classrooms, do they face, is there an interior, do you know if there's an interior corridor or does classrooms face out onto the? You're talking about the 700 yeah. building? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. When you get upstairs, what do you do? Uh, Sergeant DeRosa is still with you? He's still with me, okay. yeah. What, what do you do when you get so I found kind of a platform to rest my rifle on. I kind of took a deep breath, and I'm looking at all the windows from east to west, and it, in almost every window, the blinds were moving in every window. Uh, I, I think I had made a comment uh, to Sergeant DeRosa, you know, this is, this is impossible. Like, I can't see through the window. Uh, when I heard the report that the window had shot out and been shot out, in my mind, I was thinking of the window completely being missing. Obviously, if it has bullet holes in it, you can't shoot through the window or you can't put a gun through the window. So as I'm looking, I didn't see that situation. I did see some windows that had some bullet holes in it, but I didn't see uh, that there was a window completely broken out. So in your mind, there's a difference then between maybe what was said over the uh, over dispatch versus what you're actually seeing in that there's no window broken out. 
no, Correct. Just no right. glass at all. Shot versus shot out, yeah. Okay, so right. one being completely right. gone, glass completely gone, the other glass still in place, but shattered, maybe spider web, people right. around it going on. Correct. Right. You already, you stated you're at a, a distance of, I think you said 40 or some odd yards from the 1200 there. You see those blinds, and did you, any reason in your head why those blinds might be moving? I thought that the blinds could be moving because the students were in there. I thought this, uh, the blinds could be moving because the officers that had made entry were moving the blinds. Uh, of course, there's always that possibility that it could have been the shooter that was moving the blinds, but without knowing who was who, any attempt on my part to shoot at the shooter, I don't know what was beyond him. So I could have been shooting students. I could have been shooting other officers. So I quickly concluded that I needed to find a different job, that that wasn't going to get it done. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask you that before we move on. Um, the distance, was that, that was, was that a factor in why you could not see in those windows? Uh, it, it's, it was very light outside and very dark inside the building. And I believe that there's also tint on the windows as well as the, the blinds. So you just couldn't see inside. So, and, and you're, again, you're not up against the window, sort of cupping your no. hands over your eyes to stop the glare and looking in the window. Correct. You're, you're back. You're Correct. already 700. Correct. Uh, so it's just not possible for you to be able to tell behind this window. That's correct. Okay. So when you make that decision that the, the tactical position that you took was not helpful, in your opinion, what, what did you do here? What did you do then? I said to Sergeant DeRosa, let's, let's go over to the 1200 building, uh, you know, either... Uh, start to help rescue kids or we'll help to clear the building, whatever we can do. We need to be more useful than what we're doing right now. Okay. And what did you, so in order to accomplish that, what did you do? We ran from, well, we uh, came down the stairs and we ran across that open area uh, and we ended up settling at the east side of the 1200 building. All right. And at that time that you ran over to the east end of the 1200 building, had the SRO moved from his initial position where you had seen him? No, I believe he was where we had first, um, where we had first seen him. Let me ask you, as you're running across the, it's, it's an open area, correct? From the 12, the 700 to the 1200 building? Yes. Were you worried about sniper fire? I had, I had mentioned earlier, you know, I'm fairly tall, so I tried to make myself small. So obviously it was in my mind, but up until that point, I had never heard a shot fired since I had been on the campus. Well, what, you hadn't heard a shot fired. Uh, what would have had to have happened for you to have thought there was sniper fire? Well, I suppose there would have been uh, bullets kicking up dirt around where I'm standing. Uh, bullets would have been bouncing off the building behind me, that audible crack as a, as a round passes over my head, some of those things would lead you to believe that you're being shot at. Did you learn that from your police training or your military training or a combination of both? Kind of combination of both. Okay. So would it be fair to say at that point you were not at all uh, concerned about sniper fire, even though you had to be worried about the broken window? Yeah, uh, I wasn't worried about sniper fire at that point. All right. So when you make it over to the east end of the 1200 building, what happens then? Uh, there was a number of deputies and officers. Uh, I saw Officer Capri, who I had uh, worked in the bike unit with. with. Uh, I, I wanted to get in the fight. I grabbed him by the collar and I said, come on with me, we're going in. And I'm going, to be, I'm going to have to stop you there because I want to know why you want to do that. What do you think is causing you to do, I, you to say, I want to go in? 
I think it's a. Uh, <clears throat> It's a combination of things. It's uh, wanting, wanting to save my son, wanting to save other people's sons and daughters. It's what we signed up to do. It was our Super Bowl. You could say, if if you weren't, if you weren't ready for that day, when would you be ready? Can you restate? Earlier you told us that when Romney talked to the SRO, you didn't want to bother him, didn't want to talk to him. Yeah. He had told you, can you tell us again? What did he tell us? He pointed at the 1200 building and said, he's on the third floor. Okay. So how did that figure into why you wanted to run for the board? I figured this was the opportunity to put this to an end. I had grabbed uh, Officer Capri by the by the back of the collar, and I said, um, "This was somebody that I trusted. It's a good friend of mine, and I wanted to get in there." And I said, "Come on, let's go." And Sergeant DeRosa heard what I said, and he grabbed a hold of me and said, "No, they're making entry from the west side. I don't want crossfire." So. We stayed at the at the base of the steps that that on the east side of the twelve hundred building. Okay, so at that point now you know that law enforcement had entered the twelve hundred building from the far side, the west side of the building. Correct. Right? Okay. And in your head at this point, the shooter is up on the third floor? Correct. Okay. So you are now where are you inside the building at this point? I started off kind of inside inside the stairwell um, after I I got rebuked and told no we're not going inside. Uh, I came outside and was kind of standing at the corner of the building trying to keep an eye on windows, trying to find something to do that would make me valuable. What I mean is when Sergeant DeRosa said no, you're not going in. Um, we're going in. You know they're going in on the west side. So okay. it's kind of like stop what you're doing. Okay, you know? because right. does that relate back to what you told us earlier about you don't want crossfire blue? That's correct. Blue? Okay, yeah, officers that's correct. possibly injuring other officers. Correct on the same floor. Correct, okay. correct. makes sense. Right. So again, then what happened then? So uh, it was being relayed to us that um, the shooter had thrown his rifle down, had taken off his gas mask, and was walking down the stairs. What is your response to that? I basically ran inside, got at the base of the steps, and I thought, okay, here it is. This is this is why I'm here. So now you are inside the building. I'm inside the building. Are you inside on the first floor or are you in the stairwell? Do you remember? Um, I'm on the, I'm in the i I'm at the base of the stairwell, which is kind of separated from the rest of the first floor. And that's the east stairwell. Right? The east stairwell. And what happened? Uh, we're waiting, we're waiting, and then all of a sudden they tell us uh, he's out on the ground, he's running west. Now, describe for us what kind of effect that had on you. It, it actually, it, it kind of scrambled my brain because I thought, how in the world did this person get past us? You're waiting for him to come down that stairwell. And you're, you're waiting to kill him. Yes. All of a sudden now, the information has changed. The information changed. <laughs> what does that cause you to do? I know he's running westbound. So I ran out the door, and people followed me, and we started running. Uh, parallel to the 1200 building, and I'm focusing um, my rifle westbound towards uh, the middle school. And we're, 
At the end of the 1200 building, I looked to the right and Coach Feist uh, had been shot and was laying on the ground. I didn't know Feist at that point, but that was a gentleman that was laying there. Um, we kept moving westbound, checking every nook and cranny, every bush, every small building, every corner, uh, almost to the Walmart. I'm going to back up just a little bit. Um, I want to go back for a moment to that time where you decide to make the run from the 700 building to the east end of 1200 building. Yes. That's sort of a reconfiguration of your thinking. Mm -hmm. All right. So in the situations you're running across, all of a sudden shots are you don't know where those shots are coming from. Was that part of a reconfiguration of your thinking? I would think that the safest spot would be as tight against the 1200 building as possible. So I would probably keep on running until I got to the 1200 building. Right. And how long, so we're talking about this thinking, the reconfiguration. Now, things have changed, right? Yeah. Situations change. You determine now no sniper fire, but now you're sort of gunfire. How long, in your estimate, would you stay there in that position reconfiguring? I'd say a maximum of five or six seconds trying to figure out where the shot's coming from. Um, even if, even if this, you said a sniper, this is a sniper scenario? Is no, that what you're saying? You had eliminated the sniper. Okay, so it's so just shots fired. That. That's out of the, you okay. can already describe for the jury how you would have known the sniper scenario, okay. but that's out of the Okay, so if it's just standard shots, I can imagine five or six seconds trying to figure out where the shots are coming from and then moving to a, where the gunfire is coming from. Um, you know, the idea is the longer it takes for us to get to the shooter, every time the shot is fired, that's a kid being killed. So you would stop for a moment to figure it out, but you wouldn't stay close, correct? It's reasonable to, you know, five or six seconds to try to figure out you know, where the shots are coming from before, yeah. And then keep on moving. And you got to keep moving. Sound. Yeah. Uh, well, um, so I kind of interrupted you again. I've been doing that a lot today, I guess, and I do apologize. Uh, you had made it over to the west side of the um, 1200 building. Um, did there ever come a time that day that you saw any windows in that 1200 bill, in the 1200 building completely shot out? No, there was never any windows that were shot out, just shot. And did you come to learn that later on? Or uh, you, or yeah, obviously I, I didn't do an investigation of the whole building to see that um, they hadn't been shot out, but I'm told that none were actually shot out. Because at this point you're trying to find the shooter. He's supposedly has exited and he's out there right. going right. westbound. Right, so my focus wasn't on the building. It was rather uh, between the building and the middle school. So, for the remainder of that day, can you tell the jury what you did? Just briefly. Uh, when we almost reached the Walmart, uh, we were notified that the people were, that were communicating the intelligence were watching video that was 20 minutes old. So, when we thought we were chasing Cruz uh, across the field, he had departed that location 20 minutes previously. So, he wasn't actually there. So the rest of the time that I spent was going back because you're never sure if there's another shooter or if that information was correct. We went back and I started going classroom by classroom, uh, physically removing that class and escorting them to the parking lots. And was that in a building other than the 1200 building? Yes, it was everywhere but the 1200 building. Okay. Yeah. And finally, did there come a time that day when you saw your friend? Yeah. <clears throat> when I got to the 1200 building, I had kind of given up on trying to call him. I had called him about 10 times, and he actually called me. He was in the southeast corner of the campus, and he was huddled uh, with some other students. But at least I knew he was okay. Um, it wasn't until 
very, very late that his building was the one that was actually released and escorted out to the, to the parking lot. So I saw him very, very late that day. Very late that afternoon or early evening? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you a quick restroom break, and then we'll proceed with the cross-examination of the witness. Same admonition as always, please don't discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else. If you'll leave the notepads in your chairs and step in the back one moment, I'll be right back with you. Thank you. Outside the presence of the jury, everyone can be seated. A real quick five minute restroom break. Sir, if you're comfortable, you can stay right there. Okay, sure. If you want to step down, I just can't have you talk to anyone about your testimony. And we'll yes, be sir. right back as soon as they're back. Okay? Yes, sir.
presence of the jury. State, ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Defense, ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, please bring the jury back. Jurors entering. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Come on in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Come on in. Once you're back in those seats, you may be seated. All the parties may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you using the notepads, I'll give you a moment to get your notepads back out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, when we took our quick restroom break, we had just concluded the direct examination of the witness. We'll pick it up with the cross-examination of the witness at this point. Mr. Igarsh, when you are ready, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Sit. Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon. This is the second time that we've met before, correct? I believe so, yes. We had a chance to speak with each other during a deposition back on June 27, 2022. Isn't that correct? Um, I'll take your word for the date, but yes. And you were there under oath the same way you are today, correct? Correct. And you promised to tell the truth, the whole truth, correct? Yes. And you knew that what you were saying would be transcribed, meaning written down for you to read at a later time, correct? Correct. And did you have a chance to read this deposition before you testified today? I did. When was the last time you read this? About a week ago. Okay. And did you review your testimony with the prosecutor before you testified? Yes. You work for Coral Springs Police Department, correct? Correct. And you recognize that BSO, Broward Sheriff's Office, is a separate police agency, correct? Correct. On a separate radio channel, correct? That's correct. And unless the radios are patched, they're not hearing the same thing you are, correct? That is correct. Did you know when you got to the scene whether the radios had been patched or not? Uh, I only heard Coral Springs communicating, so I assumed that they had not been patched. Okay. 
Did you think that it would have been prudent for somebody to get them patched under the circumstances? Uh, from what I'm told with the problems that BSO was having with their radios, probably adding our radio traffic to it probably wouldn't have helped. You don't believe that it would have been a good idea under the circumstances for BSO and Carl Springs to be listening to the same real-time intelligence under these circumstances? If, if they could get that communication out clearly, what I was saying was I think with the problems of communicating, it might not have helped. Okay. So you were sitting at your desk when you got a call that came out about going to the school, correct? That's correct. Were you monitoring your radio all the way that afternoon up until the point you got to the school? Uh, yes, although uh, I was trying to make phone calls to my son, as I said earlier. Okay. while I was driving. So you would have known then from a 2 31 um, transmission that there was an active shooter at Douglas, correct? Correct. Objection here, sir. Well, yeah, the questions are contained here, see, but uh, he already answered the question. The objections are overruled. Go ahead, sir. Ask your next question. Did you also know that there were multiple gunshots being fired? Uh, I believe I did, yes. And you also knew that the Carl Springs police lines were blowing up with calls, correct? I wouldn't have known that based on the uh, radio transmission, but I can imagine that they were, yes. Did you also have, from listening to your radio, a detailed description of what a, a at least one shooter looked like? Yes. So you knew you were looking for a white male, correct? Correct. In an ROTC uniform, correct? Uh, possible ROTC with a red shirt and black pants, yeah. Okay. And you also would have known from Officer, you remember Officer Burton yes. speaking? So you would have heard him say that last seen in the three-story building, North Parking Lot, correct? Yeah, that's hearsay. That's sustained. Go did ahead, you, sir. Ask another question. Did you know when you arrived on campus whether the shooter was last seen in the three-story building? That didn't come until much later. Or North Parking Lot. Uh, that didn't come until later. When I, when I first arrived, I didn't have a location at all. Well, you arrived about 10 minutes after the shooting, which would have been about 2.37 p.m., correct? Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm not able to give times. I didn't look at my watch the whole time, but I can tell you that I learned about the 1200 building when I was uh, in, the, in the auditorium. Does that mean you did not hear the 229 transmission made by Burton about three-story building North parking lot? I'm saying when I heard that, I was in the auditorium. I didn't hear that before I got there. Okay. Did you hear or did you know that there were three victims down in the 1216 classroom in the freshman building? Did you hear that at 229.47? Uh, I don't remember that being identified by classroom, but I remember People saying that uh, there were students that were down, yes. And so you would have known that at 2.29.47, which would have been before you arrived on campus, correct? Uh, again, I can't tell you the times. I can, only, I can only say when I heard Burton's first transmission was when I was in the auditorium. I mean, you're a veteran detective. You know how important it is to listen to all the different radio transmissions that go out, correct? It's true. You don't choose which transmissions to listen to, correct? But there are times that you need to put your radio down, like when I'm donning my vest or I'm getting my rifle out. So if, there, if, there was a po if those transmissions came out while I was doing that, then I wouldn't have heard that. Plus, it's not, it's not plain speak like you and I are talking today. People are talking in, in very excited voices and sure. talking over each other. So it's not that clear. So you mean to tell me there's times where you can actually miss some transmissions because people are very excited, correct? Sure. We're talking over each other, correct? That's correct. It would be unfair to hold someone to every single transmission, correct? It would be difficult to get every single detail, yes. Got it. And when you arrive on campus, you don't immediately then run to the 1200 building or the northeast parking lot, correct? That's correct. Your mindset is that there could be, first of all, multiple shooters, correct? Uh, we didn't know, so that's right. always a possibility, yes. And until you can eliminate something, it still has to be a possibility in your head, correct? That's correct. 
We know now, for example, okay, there was one shooter and he was killing people, including children, in the 1200 building. But you didn't know that when you got there, correct? That's correct. So everything has to be in play. Everything until it's was eliminated. in play. Yep. Okay. So one of the possibilities is that there's multiple shooters throughout the campus, correct? Correct. Which is why when you arrive, you just begin to systematically go through different rooms, correct? That's correct. And you didn't do single man entries. You went with, you had other people with you, correct? Yes, I did. And explain to the jurors, when you walk into a room, and you know this far better than me, when you walk into the room, someone could be to the left, someone could be to the right, correct? That's correct. Which is why if you go in single man entry and you pick left and somebody's right, you're dead, potentially, correct? Potentially. So single man entries are never something that they advise you to do. When Unless somebody's actively shooting. Yes. I understand that. And you know precisely where the shooter's located, correct? Correct. Okay. You were going in with, with at least... Uh, th most of the time, three. Three people. Yeah. And you would go in, and like we see on TV, one side goes like this, one side goes like this, right. and you're trying to cover the dead spots, right? Correct. You don't cover the dead spots, you could be dead, correct? Correct. And you're armed wearing a vest, are you not? Yes. The vest has some weight to it, does it not? It does. And so you make a choice whether you're going to wear it all day. You're adding weight to your body by choosing to wear a vest all day, correct? Correct. They obviously vary in weight depending on how much protection is in them, but you are making a choice. And it's also, it becomes hot wearing it all day, correct? Yes. And you had in your hand a rifle, not a pistol, correct? Correct. How come? Uh, because given a rifle over a pistol, I'll take a rifle every time. How come? Because they have more power, they have more range, they're more accurate. So you see a team, and by the way, when you arrive, the shots had been long gone by then. I mean, there was no shots at all, correct? Correct. correct. You don't know what my client went through. You have no first-hand knowledge of what he thought after hearing the shots for four Jackson minutes and 15 Paul. seconds, correct? Jackson. Uh, yeah, that's the same. Go ahead, sir. Ask another question. Do you have any first-hand knowledge at all about what my client went through while the shots were being fired? Same objection, Your Honor. No. Well, okay, listen, the objection's overruled. Sir, I don't want you to guess. If you have personal knowledge, you can answer the question, or you can say, I don't know. I don't know, sir. Okay. You never had any discussions with my client no. about what he heard? Correct? No. Where he thought the shots might have been coming from, correct? That's correct. So, you did see a team at some point going into the east side of the building, correct? Yes. Before that, though, there was a team going in on the west side of the building, correct? Uh, I'm told. I couldn't see them from my vantage point, but so, I'm told there was. So, we're clear. Anybody on the west side, and my client was on the, I'm sorry, anybody on the east side, my client was on the east side, correct? Yes. You couldn't see the team entering from the west side, correct? Uh, that's correct. And... Did, it, did they announce over your radio, hey, we're the West Side team, we're going in? Um, I believe that Sergeant DeRosa was monitoring two radios at the time or was switching back and forth because he became privy to information that I didn't know. It may have been, it may have been announced over BSO's radio, but it wasn't announced over Coral Springs. And so when the East team goes in, you don't join the East team either, correct? They were already moving, they were already in before I got there. Okay. And your thought was, I think you told the prosecutor, if you go in and there's two teams, one going in from the east and the west, there could be crossfire, correct? That's correct. And so it's not uncommon for officers not to go, oh, let me just run in, right? Because there could be harm if they, if they do that, correct? That's true. This was a very stressful and chaotic scene. Would that be a fair statement? It was. It was also very confusing, correct? Yes. You have contact with my client approximately 22 minutes after the sh last fire, after the last gunfire, correct? That's correct. And my client wasn't the only officer standing there. There were several other officers standing by my client, correct? Yes. In fact, there was Officer Best standing right ne next to him, correct? Uh, I don't remember Officer Best being there when I spoke to him. I would have to take your word for it. Uh, Dej, De Danak, Danak. How do you pronounce it? Danak. He was there, correct? Uh, he, uh, pr he arrived with me. 
Okay. He wasn't part of the group with me. And Davida, correct? Davida was also with me. And so he wasn't, my client was just standing there alone. There were other officers right near him. Isn't that correct? Uh, what well, is your question before I arrived or after I arrived? Well, would you have known before you arrived what happened? Well, what I'm saying is they arrived with me. Mm -hmm. They just didn't walk up to him and, and ask him whether she was. So it's fair to say you don't know who was with my client prior to you arriving? No, I don't. Um, you can only say there were other officers near my client after you arrived, correct? That's correct. Okay. And you said you were crouching down to, quote, make yourself small, correct? Mm-hmm. Is that a yes? That's yes. Sorry. That noise. Yeah, no, I got you. Okay. And you're crouching down because why? Uh, up until that point, until I ask him where the shooter is, I don't know where the shooter is. Okay. And crouching down does what? How does that protect you? It makes me smaller. Now, if I heard your testimony correctly, you go up to my client and you asked him where the shooter was, correct? Yes. And before he gives you an answer, what he actually does is he tells you, hold on, correct? Yeah, I, th I think I actually paused and waited to ask the question because I, I think he was communicating on the radio or at least listening to the radio. It looked as if he was trying to ascertain information to answer your question, correct? Uh, he was talking on the radio. Okay. Yeah. And his demeanor, he was excited and confused, correct? Yes. And you thought that, that was understandable based upon the situation, correct? Yes, although uh, as a kind of a follow-up to that, I, the reason I went to him is, is I recognized him as the school resource officer sure. and the, the guy that probably would have the most up-to-date information. Of course. And he seemed not like he was cowering downward, but he seemed very busy, correct? Yes, correct. And you wanted to know where the shooter was because you couldn't look up and look through the windows and see where the shooter or shooters were located, correct? No, that's a rule. Go ahead, sir. You can answer that question. Oh, that's correct. Uh, it was impossible to see in the windows from the distance that we were at. So when my client is able to give you a floor of where the shooter or shooters might be located, that would have, you believed in real time, that would have had to have come from someone giving him that information, correct? In yes, that would have to be, that would be the only way, yeah. Got it. And while you told the prosecutor that you heard my client say third floor, the truth of the matter is he told you second floor. Is that correct? Well, no, 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 that's overruled. Go ahead, sir, you can answer the question. Uh, the reason that I said the second floor, one, uh, during one of the depositions, I said, when I was asked that question, I said the second floor, and then I stopped myself and I said, wait a second, that's not right. It might be the third floor. Okay. I'm not unclear what you're saying. What I'm did, saying did, is when I answered during deposition is what you're referring to, correct? Yes. Okay. When I answered during deposition, I realized I answered incorrectly. I stopped myself and I said... No, I don't believe that's correct. I believe you said the third floor. Is it your testimony that at a prior deposition, you did not say that my client told you second floor? I just affirmed that I said that during a deposition, I said the second floor and immediately corrected myself and said the third floor. And you then don't go running into the building at that point, correct? That's correct. And the prosecutor asked you about sniper fire, correct? Yes. Is it a fact that generically, when you arrive to an active shooting situation, you're thinking, unless you know otherwise, that there could be sniper fire, correct? Uh, I suppose. Uh, I guess I wouldn't be thinking about defining whether it was sniper fire or regular fire. There were, the reaction is the same. If there's fire, I need to figure out from where and move to it. Specifically as it relates to sniper fire, is it your testimony that that was out of your mind and not on the table as a possibility? Oh, sure, it was a possibility. Anything's a possibility. But that was consciously on your mind, which is one of the reasons why you crouched down, because of potential sniper fire. Isn't that correct, sir? Again, the distinction between whether I was shot by a sniper or shot by an active shooter, it wouldn't matter. 
I would be making myself small if I was running across an open area. So I don't know that I would make a distinction. I wasn't thinking I have to crouch over because I don't want to be sniped. I was thinking I didn't want to get shot. I understand that. There are many ways you could have been shot. We agree, right? Right. One of the ways is sniper fire, and that's what I'm talking about right now. You know what sniper fire is, correct? Absolutely. The prosecutor discussed that with you, and he seemed to say that was off the table in your head. You heard him say that, correct? Doesn't it look like he asked and answered? Yeah, that part has been asked and answered. That's his thing. Go ahead, sir. Ask him another question. Isn't it a fact that on your mind consciously was your concern about sniper fire? Same yes thing. or no? Yes. That's his objection's the same. That has been asked and answered. Go ahead, sir. Ask another question. You even thought specifically in your mind at the time that someone could be shooting out of a window and maybe targeting officers. Isn't that correct, sir? Objection again, Your Honor. No, that's, a, that's a rule. That's a different question. Go ahead, sir. You can answer that. Uh, I, that's absolutely correct that if a windows were shot out, that they could be shooting at officers, yes. That, that would be a concern. And isn't it a fact that you are trained that unless you know precisely where the shooter or shooters are located, that you take a tactical position of cover so that you don't get harmed from those bullets, correct? That is absolutely correct as long as there are shots not actively being taken. If there, are, if there is no shooting going on, then you're correct. If you don't know at all from the sound where shots are coming from, and we're talking about a scenario where it could cover to the east, hundreds of yards, or to the west, hundreds of yards. Are you saying it is your training to say, okay, I'm just gonna start picking places to go, or do you wait for more information and take a tactical position of cover? I think it's reasonable that if you're hearing shots fired, you can figure out whether they're being fired at you. And I think the question earlier was how would I, be, how would I know that? There would be dirt kicking up around me, there'd be bullets coming off of the wall behind me, I think it's reasonable you take a couple seconds, even if you dive for cover, like you say, to then try to figure out where the person is and move to the move to the shots. Did you see any dirt at all where my client was standing? No. Isn't it your testimony that your training is Unless you know precisely where the shooter or shooters are located, you are trained to take a tactical position of cover. Yes or no, sir? It, as long as shots are not being fired, you're, you're only asking half of the question. If, if the question is, when I arrive, if no shots are being fired, do I take a tactical position? No. I don't take a tactical tactical position. We we do a slow probe and try to figure out where the shooter is. Mm -hmm. But if the sh if if shots are being fired, then you have to move to the gunfire. Yeah. And you're saying that your training includes an area that could be potentially covering hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards in either direction, east, west, north, south. Have you ever dealt with a situation like that? Objection has to be answered. No. That's a different question. Go ahead, sir. The objection is overruled. You may answer the question. So if I can restate your question, your, your question to me is, um, given the size of the area, would I just would I just run to gunfire? Is that is that your question? No. All right, restate my, it for me if you don't mind. My question presupposes you don't know where it's coming from, and the possibilities include potentially hundreds of yards that way, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards the other direction, same way, including multiple buildings, parking lots, etc. Are you trained to just start picking one place and then just go running off and no. kind of guess? But as I said, I think you take a, I think you take six, eight, ten seconds and try to figure out where the shots are going and then okay. move in that direction. Gotcha. But if there's no further stimulus and you still don't know, you take another six to eight seconds, correct? So you're saying the shooting has stopped? Even if the student continues and you still can't tell because of pronounced echo and reverb in an area and mm -hmm. you don't even know what direction. I guess I question. would communicate over the radio and. Counsel, 
Yeah, no, that's overruled. Go ahead, sir. You can finish your answer. I was going to say, um, I think I would communicate over the radio and say, I'm hearing shots. Is it, can anybody direct me? Exactly. So you look to your radio and you see if whether anyone tells you shots fired from inside the 1200 building, correct? Yes. You got that intel because you were part of Coral Springs, correct? Yes. Do you know whether BSO ever gave that real-time intelligence to my client? I don't know because I wasn't listening to BSO's uh, channel. At no time when you were there with my client taking a tactical position of cover, did you relay any of your real-time intelligence which, with him, correct? No, I did not. Uh, there wasn't time. First of all, he was talking on the radio. But again, I said that um, I thought he, his knowledge was greater than, than mine since he was the SRO and he had been there the longest. And that might not have turned out to be very accurate at all, correct? It might not have, but... Uh, I didn't know how much more I could offer, and I didn't want to hold up his time. You did see my client with his gun drawn, correct? Yes. And you saw him communicating and listening to his radios, correct? That's correct. And you believed he was trying to get real-time intelligence to be helpful, correct? Yes. And one final question. You did see my client after this horrible, horrible day, correct? I've seen him, yes. You saw him at a funeral, correct? Yes. Related to this, correct? Yes. But you never spoke to him to find out what was he thinking in real time, correct? Yeah, that's the same. Did you have any conversations with my client at any time about Objective. what actually happened? Same objective. Are you talking about... Uh, I don't understand the question, Mr. Agosh. Are you talking any, about after February 14th, 2018? Yes, after that, that date. That's sustained. That's not relevant. Okay, thank you, sir. Based on that, any redirect? Just a few questions. Sure, go ahead. an active shooting, if the only thing you have is a pistol on you, do you still go toward the shots fired? I think you, you have to dance with the person that you took to the dance. You know, you, you elected to have that piece of equipment. Again, every shot that's being fired is a kid being killed, so you have to use the pistol. And also, you were questioned repeatedly about tactical positions. Would you take a tactical position for 40, 48 minutes? Is that a tactical position to reconfigure your, your thinking at a proper time frame? No, I, I think I had said six to 10 seconds, try to recalibrate yourself, figure out what your next move is and move on. I believe the defense counsel also said to you that it was important to know precisely where the shots are coming from. Do you need to know precisely what the shots are coming from in order to be able to move toward the shots? No, you don't need to know precisely. And, and actually, if, if you're moving on that person and they're paying attention to you and they're trying to get a shot at you, it again benefits the hostages and innocent civilians because he's paying attention to you and not shooting kids. So you can, you can move and force him to move, which is not a bad thing. And if I got you right, you would force him, in a sense, to shoot at you versus correct. innocent bystanders or innocent hostages. That's correct. Then I just want to be clear, because again, counsel needed, made a point of saying that what you knew when you got there, when you first got to the school, all you know, knew was basically that shots had been fired on the campus? That's correct. All right. And when you got there, you heard nothing? Yeah, in terms of gunfire, yes. In terms of right. gunshots, yes, yeah. correct? All right. So the information about shots or the shooter being inside the 1200 building, that did not come to you until you spoke to the defendant, correct? Uh, there was uh, or Officer Burton's communication um, when I was in the auditorium 
that identified uh, people being wounded inside uh, the 1200 building, which I recognized as a three-story building, but that's when I found out. And then the location of the shooter was then confirmed when I spoke to uh, uh, Deputy Peterson. Based on that, any recross? No, Your Honor. Okay, State, is the witness excused? Yes, sir. Sir, you may step down. Thank, Thank you, you very much. While he's doing that, State, you may call your next witness. This time, the same called Detective Miguel Suarez. Sir, if I could have you come all the way up here to the witness stand, please. Once you reach it, but before you have a seat, you can just stop and look at me, please. Yes, sir. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. And once you are seated, if I can get you to scoot that chair all the way up as far as it will go. Can you please state your full name and spell your full name? It's Miguel A. Suarez. Last name S-U-A-R-E-Z. M-I-G-U-E-L? M-I-G-U-E-L. First thing. Mr. Kilrain, you may inquire. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Detective Suarez, where do you currently work? I work at the Fire Sheriff's Office in the capacity of a crime scene detective. And how long have you worked with the SR? Uh, this will be my 15th year. And walk me through the progression of the different units you've been in. I started my uh, first seven years at the agency as a road patrol deputy in the district of Pompano Beach. And then I uh, interviewed for the position of crime scene detective in the crime scene unit, and I've been here for the last seven years. Was that your role on February 14th of 2018? Yes. Okay. Now, in regards to uh, what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, were you part of the crime scene uh, team? Yes, I was. Were there multiple members of that team? Yes, there was. Were you tasked with uh, being the crime scene uh, detective on the second floor? Yes, I was. Were there, were there other detectives for the first and third floor? Yes, there was. So you're just in regards to the second floor? Yes. You may. Detective, I'm showing you what's been previously marked as a state's X for identification. Is this a fair depiction of, uh, or do you recognize this? Yeah, it's, it's a floor plan of the uh, second floor. Second floor of the 1200 building? Yes. Okay, is this a fair depiction of the second floor? Yes, it is. Your Honor, at this time, the state would request to move into the uh, 24. Any objections? None. Without objection, state's X for identification will now be in evidence. That is state exhibit 24. Detective, when you are dealing with a crime scene this size, how is it that you break, break it up? What is the mechanism that a crime scene utilizes? That this, part, um, um, this particular uh, scene, this was uh, probably our second mass casualty event with this magnitude. So usually what you would do is you would try to break up something in this size with different tasks for 
every detective within the unit. Okay, and what were your tasks? I was tasked, uh, my first task before being tasked out to help out with the second floor of building 12 was a documentation of one of the students at, uh, at the school. And then from then on there, they tasked me with the second floor. So in, so in the second floor, what exactly crime scene wise did you do on the second floor? Did you take photographs? Yes, I did. Did you collect evidence? Yes, I did. Uh, did that evidence include things such as uh, shell casings? Yes, they did. Now, do you document precisely where different shell casings are found? Yes, I do. true and accurate representations of photographs that you took uh, back in uh, February of 2018 of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas on the second floor? Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time, the state would request the reading of Deputation Marshal Case uh, Y for identification and positive three photos yeah. taken on stage 2895. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Without objection, stage Y for identification will now be in evidence. That is state exhibit 25, a composite exhibit of three photos. Yes, it's uh, classroom twelve thirty one. Okay. Now, looking back at state uh, twenty four twelve thirty one, is that on the north or south side of the building? That's going to be on the uh, north side. Okay. So I'm showing you the second photo of state twenty five composite. Did you take that picture? Picture? Yes, I did. And what is that a picture of? Those are. Uh, suspected uh, projectile, either penetration or strike sites of the uh, far window of classroom 1231. What do you mean by penetration versus strike sites? Well, um, when a projectile, if it makes any entry through any intermediate object that it goes through, it becomes a penetration site. If it just strikes the area without any kind of penetration, it's just, I, I document it as a strike site. Now looking at just for instance um, the morgue in a minute, Your Honor, can you give me the can you give the annotator? I'm gonna try. Okay. No, I'm okay. doing the same thing. I'll just do it the way I just did before. Okay. Th this this you see this one right here? Yes. And, and just for the record, it's uh, in the middle of the of the, the photograph. What would that be considered? That would be considered um, as per. Our that's my report, uh, strike site. Okay, and that is because? It didn't, it didn't appear to make any entry through the, uh, the window. Okay, now looking at this one here. That would um, be considered a penetration site. And is that because of that little like hole, if you will, in the middle? Yes, and it appeared to make some kind of entry through that area. Now, based upon the shell casings that we're gonna get into in a minute, does it appear as if the entire projectile made its way outside the window, or is it just a fragment? It's, it, it all depends. I, can, I couldn't tell you if it's the uh, the whole projectile, but a piece of that projectile made it through. Okay, and this is facing north then? So yes, it is. Parking? Yes. Now this is the third picture from what's now stage 25. Is that just a drawn out view of what we were just looking at? Yes, that's what we would consider like a, a overall or intermediate photo of the same uh, Project of penetration or suspected uh, strike site. Okay. 
Ray. States Z for identification, a composite of seven photographs. Can you please review these? Yes. Did you take these photographs? Yes, I did. Are these a true and accurate representation of the south side of the uh, building uh, 12 that you took uh, in February 2018 at Margaret Stoma Douglas? Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time, the state requests removal of the images. Was there any other previously marked for identification as states Z, a composite of seven photographs uh, of pages 14 to 6? Any objections? No objections. Without objection, states Z for identification will now be in evidence. That is State's Exhibit 26, a composite exhibit of seven photos. Detective, showing you the first picture of what's now in evidence of State's 26. Do you recall taking this photograph? Yes, I do. Okay. And in what room is this? This is uh, classroom 1234. And is this on the south side of uh, the 1200 building? Yes, it is. Now, in the photograph, I'm, the, the pointer doesn't work, so I'm going to have to use my finger. What are these items that are over there that I'm pointing you to? Those are uh, two uh, cartridge casings that were just right outside the door. Or cartridge casings, are those part of a bullet? Yes, they are. Which, which part of the bullet? Just it's the casing that holds in any kind of projectile or any other propellant inside the, uh, the shell casing. Okay. Now looking at the second photograph, is the, was this photograph taken inside of room 1234? Yes, it was. Okay. And the mark right there, once again, I have, I'll have to use my finger. Do you see that mark right there? Yes, I do. And what is that consistent with? That's uh, consistent with another uh, suspected uh, penetration site, which on this point, it's on the far blind of the classroom. Okay, now looking at this over here on the, on the left side of the picture, what is that consistent with? That's uh, another uh, familiar uh, projectile penetration site. Now looking at the third picture in States 26. What is this like sticker there? What, what, is, what is that what uh, the purpose of that? Those are, those are usually, they're measuring the adhesive measuring scales. Um, every time we're, we're documenting any part of the scene that has to do with either, uh, it could be suspected penetration sites, it could be um, simple just evidence items. We put those on the uh, picture just to help better grasp and view the uh, either the size or the uh, definition of the area that we're taking the picture of. And if I'm not mistaken, it says 1234K. What is the K, an indicator? Yeah, so, um, on this particular room, um, we had so many either penetration sites or strike sites that I start lettering them either from A, B, C, all the way up. And this particular case, as you guys can see, it's already at the K at this particular time. Now zooming in at K. And now it's hard to see on this. Let me see. Where is the strike site or penetration? In this particular photo, it's it's just about the adhesive scale, and it's just right it's right through the uh, screened in area of the window. So now there is no. Do you see any, or do you remember recall seeing any um, damage to the actual window pane consistent with this? Um, not not in this area, no. Okay. Yeah. But this photograph was taken because of the tear, so to speak, in the in the screen. Yes. 
and are looking at the fifth picture, focusing in on over here. Based, do, you, do you recall taking this photograph as well? Yes. Okay. Now, based upon what you see there, and I guess it's one, two, three, four G, is that consistent with a, a strike or with a penetration? That's with a strike. Right. Looking at the next photo, which is a close up of what we just looked at, how can you tell it's a strike as opposed to a penetration? Um, that. Um, that made, the, as you can guys see, it's uh, 1234G. It made a penetration <laughs> to the screened in area, but with the window, um, I did not see any penetration to that window. And just for clarification purposes, silly question, but there's a screen before the actual glass pane uh, in these windows. Yes, that means the particular um, projectile or fragment, um, uh, which it made contact with an intermeric, uh, intermeric uh, target, which was the screen, and then it eventually hit the uh, the window. So it hit, it hit the screen, but then hit the window. Yes. And then this is just a zoomed out uh, picture of the exact uh, same thing. <coughs> now, do you recall how many shell casings you recovered from the second floor? I believe it's a total of six. Do you want to request witness? You may. Detective, I am now showing you what's already been previously marked for identification as uh, 2A, or AA, uh, state's identification. Take a look at this. Do you recognize this? These are the uh, shell casings that I documented, photographed, and collected on that particular day. Are these shell casings in the same or substantially the same condition as when you recovered them? On yes, the sir. Your Honor, at this time, the state would request to move in states uh, 2A or AA into evidence as page 127. Any objection? Okay, no objection. Without objection, states 2A for identification will now be in evidence. That is states exhibit 27. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to take a quick moment and then pass it to your neighbor, and once it goes all the way around, the attorney will collect it again. I'll remind you, this item, as well as all these exhibits and evidence, will be back with you when you are deliberating the case. So this won't be the only chance that you get to view the material. Uh, again, everything that's moved into evidence in the case will be back with you in the jury room when you are deliberating the case. Detective, where precisely, we can go just go through one by one, where did you find these shell cases? For reference purposes, states 24 is in front of you on the screen. 
in each box, as you will see, I marked um, the room number that they were located just outside of, and also the uh, the caliber or, the, or head stamp information of the round. Okay, so let's start with the first one, the top one there. Where did you find that shot? And here it says uh, 1234, I mean 1231. FC1, which is fire casing one, and which states is outside of, of room 1231. Okay. So in the hallway? Yes. Okay. Looking at the second one, the second casing. Okay. This one is, uh, is 1231 FC2, fire casing two, and it's right here. It says I collected it, um, soft wall, just outside room 1231. What do you mean by soft? It's just right. Um, it's not right next to uh, 1231 classroom. It's just a little bit. It's just a little bit away from it. So, like on the wall. Yes. As opposed to near the, near the door. Yes. Okay. Um, after this was found in the hallway as well. Yes. Okay. What about the third one? The third one. Um, about uh, it's uh, casing FC1 fire casing one, and this one was 12 just outside room 1232. On the hallway. In the hallway? Yes. Okay. So 1232? Yes. Okay. Are those consistent with the uh, strike, the strike, shot strikes that you saw at the window panes heading towards the north side of the building? Yes. Okay. Looking at the fourth one. This is, uh, it has uh, 1234, which is classroom 1234, is fire casing one, and it's uh, I marked on here um, the floor just outside of classroom 1234. Okay. Was that in the hallway? It, it was. It was uh, right next, almost next to the door of 1234. Okay. But was it in the classroom or in the hallway? No, it was in the hallway. It wasn't in the classroom. Okay. How about the fifth one? This is uh, bar casing two. Again, <coughs> um, room to, uh, classroom 1234, and on the floor just outside classroom. Okay. So in the hallway. Yes. Okay. What about the sixth one? The sixth one, uh, fire casing three, as it states here, classroom 1234, and it's collected on floor near door of classroom. This one was a little bit more kind of in a threshold of the classroom, like near the door. Near, near where the door is. Where the door be. opens right on the threshold. Understood. Were any shell casings found either in 12, inside the classroom, the 1231 or 1234? No, this was the closest one, it was within the threshold. Okay. And of those six shell casings, consistent with uh, how many shots being fired on the second floor? Uh, yes, as, as far as casings wise, we found, yes. You found six? Six. All in the hallway? That? All in the hallway? Yes. Okay. So going back to states 26. this photograph and what you see there differ from what you saw on the north side of the building in terms of the uh, shot strike or the, penetra the shot that penetrated? Well, this one in particular, it's, um, uh, you could always, um, you can see that it just, see, it was more of a strike mark, not a penetration. It did, uh, if, you, if you'll see the red um, on this, um, window plane, you'll see different areas that pieces of projectile probably penetrated the screen, but this one in particular is a penetrated the wind, um, penetrated the screen, but just struck the window with no penetration. So it didn't go outside the window, it stayed inside? No. Whereas in t States 25, looking at this one here, with that little hole in the middle, something went outside. Yes, it appears so. Okay. Now, room 1234. Showing uh, what's been defense uh, ID. Do you recognize this? Can you take a look at it. Yes. Okay. Do you see 
approximately, or not approximately, DC Building 12. That's right over here. Okay. Your Honor, may I would ask the witness to come Sure. Over? North, south, east, west. Looking at room 1234, so the one that you're looking at on the screen, is that south or north? This is uh, building 12, so this will be south, this will be north. Okay, so this one, 1234 though, is that heading, that's heading south? That's will be this way. Okay, and based upon the photographic evidence that you took from room 1234, no projectiles came outside of that? As far as the pictures that I've taken and documented, no. Did anything else during your investigation when you were on the second floor show that any projectiles went out any of the windows facing south? As far as I documented, no. Okay, cross-examination, go ahead. We have no questions. Great, is the witness excused? He is. Sir, you may step down, thank you very much. While he's doing that state, you may call your next witness. Sir, once you're seated, if I could just scoot that chair all the way up as far as it will go to. Can you please state your full name and spell your full name? Danny Polo. Last name's P-O-L-O. D-A-N-N-Y? D-A-N-N-Y. All right. State. Give me one second. Just for future reference, do you see the annotator on your screen there? Yes, Judge, I do. Okay, very good. So, Thank you. Okay. Just the three lines. I don't see anything with three lines, actually. Understood. Thank you very much. Okay, State, you may inquire. Ms. Gomes, go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, before we get started, can you explain to the members of the jury why it is that you're wearing a face covering? Yeah, I apologize for that. Um, um, I wear a mask because I work in an undercover capacity, and uh, there's been threats made against my life, so... I'm on the TV right now. <laughs> Don't want people to know what I look like. Speak up. Sorry. I need you to speak up. I said, uh, I, so I, I work in an undercover capacity and threats have been made against my life. So since I'm on the TV right now, I'm trying not to show my face to everyone. And so you're wearing the mask just because of your line of work, it's important to keep your identity concealed. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Detective, would you please introduce yourself to the jury? Tell them where you work and what unit you're currently assigned to. I, uh, I currently work for the Broward County Sheriff's Office in the Money Laundering Task Force. Prior to that, I was in the Gang Investigations Unit. And prior to that, I was in the Organized Crime Unit. 
How long have you been a contested court? Since 2017, um, six, seven years. And explain to the jury how ESO is kind of structured. Are you assigned to a specific district? How does that work? Yeah, so most uh, deputies are assigned to districts. Um, so uh, Deerfield Beach, Pompano, West Park, Dania, um, I believe we have 15 districts. Um, the courthouse is one of them. And uh, there's also county-wide specialized units. Um, so like the Money Laundering Task Force is a county-wide unit. Um, we handle um, everything in the county, not just uh, specific districts. So as part of your assignment to the Money Laundering Task Force, you're currently assigned to the entire county? Currently, yes. Okay. I'd like to turn your attention to February of 2018. What was your assignment at that time? I was with the Deerfield Beach Crime Suppression Team. So I worked in the city of Deerfield Beach. I was assigned to the city of Deerfield Beach, and I worked uh, in their crime suppression team. What is a crime suppression team? Um, primarily handle any, any crimes that the city might be having issues with. So burglaries, if there's burglaries in a specific part of the city, we would handle that. Robberies, if there's a, you know, if there's a robbery issue going on in a certain part of the city, we would handle that. Uh, narcotics enforcement, firearms, violent crimes, um, anything that the city might need. Um, we're kind of uh, just supposed to handle anything they, they request. So every changes from day to day. And that's a role as a detective? Yes. Okay. So specifically, February 14th, describe for the members of the jury what you were doing that day. Uh, if I remember correctly, we had just finished an operation. I don't recall exactly what we were doing, but I remember... We had just got back to the police station. I'd taken off all my gear, my vest and all that. And uh, we were just cleaning up. Um, and uh, then we got uh, a call um, that there was a shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. When you got the call, what did you do in response? And where, I'm sorry, what city? You said you were in Deerfield? City of Deerfield Beach. Okay, and so what did you do in response to getting the call? We all quickly left the office. Um, I jumped in my partner's car for that day. Um, grabbed, I grabbed, uh, I had just gotten a new vest, so I uh, went to my car and grabbed my rifle plates out of it, um, which are plates that you would put inside a vest, or steel plates, um, and uh, it's to stop rifle rounds. I grabbed those out of my car because they weren't inside my new vest yet and I took them inside my partner's car so I can put them in the vest on our way there. And did the rifle plates fit? No, unfortunately they didn't. Uh, they Describe weren't. Describe for the members of the jury, so a regular vest that's worn under a law enforcement uniform, um, what's the proper term for it, that type of vest? Soft armor. The soft armor vest. Will a soft armor vest stop a rifle round? No. So if you're wearing a soft armor vest, what protection does that offer you if you're going up against a rifle? None. It might slow the, down, the, round, the round down a little bit, but it really won't stop anything. It'll go right through. So not much different than not having a vest at all? It's basically the same thing. And so that day, you did not have the plates that would protect you from a rifle, and you were instead wearing a soft armor vest? Yeah, I was wearing a soft armor, like it's, a, it's called a plate carrier. It's to hold rifle plates. It has soft armor in it, but the plates didn't fit, so I wasn't able to put the plates inside. And did that deter you from driving to the scene of where the shooting was happening? No. Describe for the members of the jury the type of firearm you had. I had my uh, HNK 9mm handgun. A regular pistol? Yes. Did the fact that you didn't have a rifle deter you from driving to the shooting? Explain for the jury what's going on in your head when you get a call that there's a shooting happening at a school and you realize that you're driving directly to it. So initially, I mean, we get a lot of shooting calls when you respond or you work for a crime suppression team or you're out on the road working road patrol. You get shooting calls all the time. And uh, usually it's, I would say most of the time they're not real shootings. You know, it's firework or, or it's just you never figure out what it is. Um, so we were responding um, like we would to any other call, any other shooting call, at, you know, lights and sirens going pretty fast. Um, and then 
we heard over the radio that uh, someone announced that there was a, a victim with gunshot wounds. That's when we knew it was a, it was going to be a real one, and not like every other shooting call that we get where you respond and it's nothing happened. I'm going to ask you to move closer to the microphone so I yeah. can hear it. Okay. Yeah. I'm right. going to ask you to speak very close to the microphone. Sure. As you are driving there, is there anything that you need to do in order to prepare yourself for an active shooter situation? Yeah. I, we weren't, uh, like I said, we were responding like we would to any other call, but once we got confirmation that it was we had victims and it was 100% a real shooting. Um, you have to put yourself in a different headspace. You have to prepare for it mentally. And uh, I remember looking at my partner and once we heard that there was victims, um, just kind of looked at each other like, all right, this is it, this is real. We, we gotta do this. And I remember fist bumping him and just kind of psyching ourselves up, getting ready for what we might have to run into. When you say fist bumping, is this a jovial situation? No. What do you mean by psyching yourself up? You're possibly going to get shot. <laughs> so it's not a situation any of us want to be in. Going up against a guy with a, fi uh, with a rifle, getting shot at, even with a handgun. Like, no one wants to walk into a shooting. It's, yeah. it's the unknown. It. It's, what, it's what we're paid to do. As you are pulling up to the school, where do you arrive on the campus? Initially, someone um, told us to respond to the south, uh, I believe it was a, to the football field. And we responded to the football field. When we got there, we noticed that uh, there was nothing to do at the football field. So we moved towards the gate so that we can proceed to enter the school. Do you recall hearing stay 500 feet back as you're on your way to the school? Yes. And what did you do with that instruction? We disregarded it. And why did you have to disregard that instruction? It didn't make sense. It wasn't a smart command. You know, you know, during an active shooter, you're not supposed to stage outside of it. You're supposed to go inside. At the time, did you know that Scott Peterson was the person that said that over the radio? No, I was. I didn't know who was reporting. Uh, making commands over the radio. In order for you to properly respond to this active shooter situation, did you need to disregard what you later learned to be Scott Peterson's command? Yes. When you arrived to the campus and you eventually worked your way towards the 1200 building? Yeah, we stopped at the football field for, I want to say maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Um, these are approximations. Um, a parent approached me they were trying to get inside the school because their kid was in there. I uh, reassured them that we had it, and that we were going to take care of everything, and uh, stopped him from going inside the school because that would have created concerns and issues for law enforcement on scene. Um, when I realized, after speaking with him, I realized we need to keep moving, so we got back into the car, moved to the gate uh, where the entrance was. Um, and at that point, we made contact with a couple of their officers and we proceeded to run inside. Now, I want to be clear about the timing. Approximately what time did you arrive on campus? It was about 2.35 to 36 p.m. And how many minutes after the first shots did you arrive on scene? First shots were about 2.21 p.m. So it was 15 minutes. And about how many minutes after it was announced shots fired did you arrive on scene? After the first shots were fired? After it was announced by Scott Peterson, shots fired what? at approximately about 12 two, minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah, about 12 minutes. So 12 minutes after Scott Peterson announces shots fired, you arrive on scene? Yes. Okay, so describe what happens once you make your way to the 1200 building. We ran inside, it was a team of four of us. Um, no specific reason why we had four of us. It just, it was me and my partner, and then um, we ran into a, one of the, our SWAT operators, and uh, he looked around, saw another SWAT guy coming up. So we flagged him over, we got together. Uh, we ran towards the building. Um, There's two deputies that were 
um, behind the vehicle. We made contact with them, asked them what was going on, and they gave us a they gave us instruction on what what was what they knew at the time, um, which was they pointed at the building where the suspect was last seen, or Nick Cruz was last seen, and uh, they said that's where the last shots were fired, and they informed us that the other buildings had not been cleared, so we didn't know where or if he was in any other buildings. I'm going to ask you to move closer to the microphone. Did you hear any gunshots while you were on scene? No, we arrived on scene. There's no more gunshots. To the best of your knowledge, were any VSO deputies other than Scott Peterson on scene while there were gunshots going on? No, there was no other VSO deputy there. there was, I don't believe there's any other police officer there. The only police officer on scene while gunshots were going off was Scott Peterson. Yes. Now, when is there first, I want you to explain, uh, if you hear no gunshots, so explain to the members of the jury how <coughs> the gunshots or stimulus would have impacted the way that you moved through that campus. The way we're trained by the sheriff's office is um, when responding to a shooting, if you, or to an active shooter specifically, um, if you arrive and you're hearing gunshots, uh, they call that a stimulus, and you're supposed to respond by moving towards the sound of the stimulus. So if you hear gunshots coming from a specific area, you're supposed to move directly to that area um, and keep following that sound, because every time you hear a gunshot, it's a possible victim, someone who's just getting shot at. Um, now, what if you don't know precisely where a gunshot is coming from? What does common sense dictate? just move towards the sound of that, that gunshot. You, you can hear the specific direction where something's coming from, so you just move towards it and then follow that sound. If there's multiple, multiple gunshots, then you would keep moving towards that sound. And if you're standing somewhere where there's an echo, does it make sense to remove yourself from that hallway so that you can better hear? No. What I, would you do to hear? Just get closer to it. I know it sounds silly, but what would you do to be able to hear the sound? Just keep moving towards it. I've, we, when we do training, they do, you know, fake or not fake, but they use you know blank shells and they replicate gunshot sounds. And I know that we can follow that gunshot. Yeah, there's an echo, but you know if it's coming from upstairs or it's coming from the same floor, you can hear it, um, and you can effectively move in the direction of a sound. Is responding to the sound of gunfire something you train for? Yes. And you work for the Broward Sheriff's Office, the same police department as Scott Peterson, correct? Correct. Okay. So explain what happens next once you are inside or at the doors of the 1200 building. When we arrived at the building, um, we entered the first floor and we saw that, uh, I believe it was Coral Springs uh, Police Department officers had already entered the first floor and they were clearing forward on the first floor. So at that point, um, they didn't, it didn't appear that they needed any more bodies on the first floor, so we moved on to the second floor and began to um, move in that direction. We didn't have any gunshots that we were hearing all week. You know, I, I smelled the odor of the gunfire. You could still smell the gunfire when we walked in, so in our minds it's still fresh, and it must have just recently happened, which it did, but... We weren't there fast enough. Up until this point, when you are realizing the first floor is taken care of and you have to move up, have there been any dispatch or radio issues? No, I didn't. I didn't have any dispatch issues till later on, um, after arriving. So, thirty minutes later. So, as you're on your way to the scene, are you able to hear things that are coming over the air? Yes. And so much so that you heard the state 500 feet back. Yeah, and state 500 feet back. Um, respond to the to the football field. Um, then uh, a, a lieutenant took over the radio and started giving commands to respond directly to the school. Um, yeah, we heard all that. At some point, do you start to have radio issues? Yeah, there was a point where we realized that there was radio issues, but it's not something that we realized right away. Um, because we're inside the school, so there's really no reason to be getting on the radio. 
other because you're with everyone that's helping you clear the school. So you would just be speaking to them directly, not getting on the radio and telling them what you're gonna be doing. You're just gonna communicate with the officers that are with you. To the best of your memory, approximately how long after the shooter had left the building entirely did you start to notice radio problems? Uh, let's see, maybe 20 minutes. Describe, like you just explained, how you speak to each other in person. Describe how the radio factors in while you're trying to work your way through the building. Well, while, while we're working through the building, you're not getting on the radio. You're, you're with everyone that's going to be clearing the building with you. There was, at that, that time, probably over 20 officers in there, and everyone's with us, so you don't need to get on the radio to tell the guy behind you what you're going to do. You just tell the guy behind you, I'm going to clear this room, I'm going to go this way, I'm going to take this hallway, and you give directions to people. Um, while we were in there, we were with uh, a couple of SWAT operators, and at that point, when you have SWAT guys with you, they like to take command of these scenes because this, this is what they specifically train for is, it's more tactical for them. So it makes more sense for them to direct you at that point. Um, but anyone can decide to do anything as long as you're communicating with everyone that's with you, with your team. What floor did you, did you go to the second floor? We initially went to the second floor. What happened? Uh, we started getting um, communications from someone watching the video, uh, doing the video playback, and they were giving us the positions of where Nicholas Cruz was. Um, unfortunately, it was delayed. Um, we weren't getting, it wasn't a live update, it was a delayed up update where the video was, they were watching it from a different, from a, several minutes back. So we think we're inside the building with him, but he was already gone. During that moment, you thought that you were in the building with the shooter? Yes. How did you get the information that there was, I know it was wrong information, but how did you get this information that there was some, that the shooter was still in the building? Over the radio. And what do you do in response? Where does everybody go? We were on the second floor, um, and someone keyed up over the radio, someone that was watching the video, and they told us that uh, Nicholas Cruz was on the third floor. Um, so now we're all obviously looking up the stairwell towards the third floor because this, the person that's doing these shootings is on the third floor. So we have to keep an eye upstairs now. Um, so I remember everyone kind of just turning up and looking up at the same time when uh, they told us that he was on the third floor. Um, then we were told that uh, Nicholas Cruz was going to be coming down the third floor, uh, down the stairs on the third floor. At that point, everyone turned and pointed their guns in that direction because if he came down, it was with a rifle, it was probably going to be a gunfight, and uh, everyone was going to respond. And in that moment, you still only had your pistol, correct? Right. What happens next? Um, ser several people began to clear the second floor um, looking for you know, victims, people that are injured. And um, we then, I remember the, uh, a couple of officers were sent to the third floor to start clearing that, to get us into the third floor. And uh, then I was called for, um, they said they needed um, more people upstairs because um, there was uh, several uh, people injured that needed uh, medical attention. In that moment, did that communication indicate to you that manpower would be important? Yes. And that it was needed, additional bodies were needed on the third floor? Yes. In response to that, did you assist and go up to the third floor? Yes, uh, I ran up to the third, to the third floor, and uh, at that point, um, one of the other officers was uh, dragging um, one of the students, Anthony Borges, um, through the stairwell door, and they placed him on the. They placed him on the third floor landing, before you go down to the second floor. Describe Anthony Borges' condition. He was bleeding heavily. Um, he had been bleeding for a while, and uh, his clothes were covered in blood. And he was he, he was visibly in pain. He was just groaning, and um, 
Um, uh, I just I, I went down to the floor. I didn't have I didn't have gloves, or I don't remember if I had gloves, but I didn't put them on at that point. And uh, I uh, noticed one of his legs was thoroughly soaked in blood. I uh, took a tourniquet that I carried on my vest right here, took it off, and I began to apply the tourniquet um, to stop the bleeding. After I stopped the bleeding on that leg, um, some of the SWAT medics had just come upstairs, and we began to kept tending to all his injuries. He had bullet holes in, the, in his back, in his chest, um, his other leg, and uh, started to cut off his clothing so we can assess all the injuries and make sure that um, we tended to all the wounds before we began to transport him. By the time you applied a tourniquet to Anthony Borges, how long had he been laying there bleeding out, needing help? Over 25 minutes, maybe longer. Describe what else happened on the third floor. At that point, after we finished um, applying tourniquets to his uh, legs and the SWAT medics um, addressed the wounds on his back and his chest, we, uh, we put him on a, it's kind of, it's like a black, uh, black tarp and we took him out downstairs, went all the way to the first floor and then exited to the opposite entrance where we came in through. Um, we placed Mr. Borges on a, on a golf cart and they took him to the nearest ambulance or fire truck. What happens next? Continued, continued checking all the classrooms for additional victims and began reassessing um, anyone that had um, anyone that had injuries. Um, there was a lot of injured people. There was a lot of that. There was a lot of dead kids that we couldn't tell if they were alive or dead. Um, we had to go to every single student and assess whether they were alive or dead. And if, if they were alive, we had to address their, their injuries. I know there was a, a female on the third floor that my partner thought we felt a pulse on and we had to take her downstairs, but she had also passed. Um, so it was just going from door to door, just making sure we took care of all the injured students. Once the students that could be treated uh, were treated in the police attorney and he was deceased, what else did you do as far as the 1200 building or did you move on and assist in other ways? We stayed in the 1200 building for a while. Um, we had to evacuate the entire school. By this point, we had learned that Nicholas Cruz was no longer in the building and um, he was then sh shortly thereafter taken into custody. Once he was taken into custody, we began evacuating the school. Um, and we just assisted all the students in leaving. Anyone with injuries were assisted out. Um, I personally was on the first floor, um, just reassuring the kids and helping them get out. And, you know, obviously the kids are scared. And obviously the kids were scared and uh, they... They needed uh, you know, kind words to reaffirm and help them get through that moment. Did you know uh, Scott Peterson prior to this incident? No. I'm going to ask you to take a look over at the defense table. Did you see the gentleman sitting at that table on the left inside the 1200 building on that day? Not that I can recall. Were you wearing a body camera? I was. And was it recording? Yes. Did you have a chance to make sure that the recording was proper? and review it before prior, prior to coming to court today? Yes.
Danny, I'm showing you what has been pre-marked as states X. Did you have a chance to review the body worn camera? Yes, I reviewed it. Judge, at this time, the state moves into evidence what's been pre-marked as states X as states. Oh, I'm sorry. It's been pre-marked as... It'll be pre-marked as states B, and we'll be coming into evidence as 28. Any objections? No new objections other than my motion. No additional objections? Correct. Yeah. Okay, over the defense objections. States 2B for identification will now be in evidence. That is States Exhibit 28. Your Honor, may I have permission to publish? You may. Court Deputy Rakowski, everything's off, right? Extremely important. He was. He had lost a lot of blood. Um, he was just very injured. Um, I, I noticed that you were applying this medical to find that he was medical. Is it, is it called combat medical? What is the true term for it? Combat medicine. I think now they're calling it. Not what the sheriff's office is calling it, or not what the sheriff's office is calling it. I think technically the military calls it something else. It's a T triple C, it's tactical combat. It's basically just combat medicine, basically, which is applying applying medical intervention as quickly as possible on the field before you transport someone to the hospital. That way they don't keep losing blood, um, and you can address you know critical injuries like a, a punctured lung and stuff like that before you start transporting them. It's been shown to increase the rate of survival for for injured injured people in the military. Um, and the application of tourniquets and chest seals and you know, packing wounds and stopping the bleeding is the most important thing. Yeah, it's standard training that everyone in the sheriff's office receives. Is that it? Nothing further? Okay, 
cross-examination to his testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Corbett. Afternoon, sir. I just wanted to clarify one of the things that you said. Was it not your testimony that when shots are being fired, was it your testimony that no other deputies were on scene to hear shots fired? Is that your testimony? I believe that's what, that's what was learned after they did the investigation into the shooting. Is that what you believe? That's what you're swearing to today? I'm sorry, can I ask one question? Yeah, that's the same. Is that your firsthand knowledge based upon what you learned that day? I believe that's what was learned during the Parkland Commission. So it's your testimony that Sergeant Miller wasn't there to hear shots? Sir, I don't know. That's what I believe. I don't, I don't recall anything else. Is it your testimony that Deputy Kratz wasn't there to hear shots? Like that's not personal knowledge. Yeah, that, well, it's overruled, but sir, I don't want you to speculate or guess. If you have personal knowledge of some of these things, you can say what your answer is, and if you don't, you can say I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, sir. Do you know whether Deputy Perry was there to hear shots? I don't know, sir. Do you know whether Deputy Goolsbee was there to hear shots? I don't know. Do you know whether Deputy Stumbach was there to hear shots? I don't know. And what about Deputy Seward? Do you know whether he was there to hear shots being fired? No, sir. I don't know. You did testify that you did hear Deputy Kratz announce shots fired from the football field, correct? Objection, counsel. That's why that's not in the record, Your Honor. No, that's overruled. You can answer that question, sir. Go ahead. I don't recall who made those. I stated that I don't know who got on the radio and made any of these statements. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I said I don't, I stated during my direct that I did not recall because I wasn't sure who was getting on the radio, who was making these statements. Okay, but you definitely heard the substance of someone announcing over the BSO radio shots fired from the football field, correct? No, sir. They said to stage by the football field. Was what? Stage by the football field. Are you saying stage? Stage, like go to the football field. That's what we were told to respond to. Okay. Not because there were shots there. Okay. So you're hearing over BSO radio someone referring to the football field, correct? Yes, sir. And you don't know who it is who's referring to the football field, correct? No, sir. You arrived long after shooting was over, at least 15 minutes after the first shots, correct? Approximately, yes. And when you went in, you were with a team of at least four, correct? Yes, sir. Who told you where the shooter or shooters were located? How did you learn that? When we went inside the fence, we sprinted to a vehicle where there was two deputies standing behind. And one of the deputies told us the information that the shooting, the last known location was the 1200 building. Okay. So you spoke to someone who gave you that information, correct? Yes, sir. You don't know where he got that information from, correct? No, sir. Just so we're clear, it wasn't because you heard it over the BSO radio, correct? I don't recall. Now, the prosecutor asked you about what your training tells you to do. The truth is you've never had a training where the possible sounds could be coming from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards in one direction or hundreds and hundreds of yards in the other direction. Same thing forward, same thing back. They don't train for that, correct? Hundreds? No. Do they do that training? No, sir. No. Your training, they typically narrow it down to one area and you're supposed to go in, right? Usually you're inside a large building. Correct. Like a school. Got it. So they don't have a scenario where you literally, like you're hearing a siren and you're driving along in your car, right? Have you ever heard that before? Yes, sir. And you literally do not have any idea where the sound's coming from? They don't train you with that kind of scenario, do they? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Police officers don't have any better ability to hear a loud noise 
and know precisely where that noise is coming from, correct? No, but you would know the general area where it's coming from. Oh, sure, correct. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, sir. Ask your next question. But officers don't have any special training or abilities to hear something and know better than a non-officer precisely where something's coming from. Isn't that correct? That's an actual question. No, that's overruled, sir. You can answer the question. We would, like anyone else that can hear, we would know which direction it's coming from. You knew that there was people in the video room trying to look at surveillance to find out where the shooter or shooters were located in real time, correct? That was your testimony, correct? Yes. And did you also know that it was my client who was relaying that information to people on the scene? Objection, counsel testified. Well, that's overruled. Again, sir, I don't want you to guess, but if you have personal knowledge, you can answer the question. Go ahead. No, I previously stated I have no idea who was giving the okay. instructions or who was telling us what, what was going on from the video room. On scene, there were issues with your BSO police radio, correct? Yeah, after, after we arrived, okay. after time had elapsed. And the experience is what you call throttling, correct? Yes. Explain to the jurors <laughs> what was happening with your radio in terms of throttling. What does that mean? It just means you can't communicate. You click the radio, and it'll make a, like a bonking noise, and you can't tell other people anything. It just won't come through. And you experienced that when you got onto the campus, correct? Experienced it after, after we had been on the second floor for several minutes. And it's not an issue if you're with a team of people and you can communicate them with them real close, correct? Yeah, that's what I testified to. But when you're waiting for dispatch to give you information and the radios are throttling, that's a problem, correct? You're on scene at a shooting, so you wouldn't be waiting for dispatch to give you information. You'd be the one giving the information out to other people responding. That wouldn't change the way I respond because I'm there. So I wouldn't need to tell dispatch I'm going to the third floor. I didn't do that, as you saw from the body cam. I just went to the third floor. My question was, if you're waiting for real-time intelligence from dispatch and you have a radio that's throttling, that could hinder your ability to hear that information, yes or no, sir? It would hinder your ability to give dispatch the information. It wouldn't hinder your ability to respond to the shooting if you're on scene. Because you're on scene. You are the real-time information. Dispatch is not on scene with the shooter. So they do not have real-time information. They have second information from whoever is giving that to dispatch. Additionally, when there's other officers on the scene trying to communicate with other BSO deputies who aren't within a few feet, having radio throttling, that could prevent people from being able to give real-time intelligence to other BSO deputies. Yes or no, sir? Giving real-time information to other deputies responding is not your primary duty when responding to a shooting. You're, that wasn't my question, sir. Would it hinder you from telling other people what, what's going on? Yes, that it, was my question. It would, but that's not what you would be doing anyways. Okay, so the answer to my question was yes. If one officer wanted to convey to another officer real-time intelligence, having a radio that's throttling would interfere with their ability to effectively carry that out, yes or no, sir? Yes, sir. Nothing further. Based on that, any redirects? Can you explain the uh, training at the school that you referenced? Sometimes they were at schools. Sometimes they were just like large malls, uh, buildings were that were either decommissioned and the owners would let us go train in them. Um, they're just kind of very much like a school, you know, sometimes multi-story, long hallways, lots of doors. Um, they play loud, loud noises of people screaming to kind of simulate, you know, uh, havoc and chaos. And then they simulate gunshots coming from different rooms, um, you, either using speakers or, or using um, handguns with, uh, with dummy rounds in them, you know, rounds that aren't, uh, there's no cartridge, there's no bullet, it's just the, the explosion sound from the, from the bullet. Um, so they would 
play that in different rooms and your job is to move in the sound of the gunfire and find find the shooter. And those are to simulate active shooter situations? Yes. I have nothing else. Based on that, any recross? No, Your Honor. State, is the witness excused? Yes, Judge. All right, sir, you may step down while Thank he's doing Honor. that. Can we a quick sidebar, please? Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to press pause on the state's presentation at this point. Uh, same admonition as always. Please don't discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else until we reach the end of the case. If you will leave the notepads in your chairs, they will be waiting for you when you go back home. I'm going to repeat my uh, continued request. Uh, please do not do any research on this case directly or indirectly from any source whatsoever. Uh, I'm going to ask you to please not watch the news, not read the newspaper, no research on social media, on the internet, from any source whatsoever regarding the people, places involved in the case. Um, I hope you all have a nice night. I'm going to ask you to be back tomorrow, uh, which is Tuesday, June 13th at 9.15 at the jury room, 9.15 a.m. tomorrow morning, Tuesday. All right, have a good night. See you tomorrow morning. can be seated. State, you wanted to discuss scheduling going forward. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Judge. Tomorrow, we do have several witnesses, but I don't believe that they'll go longer than the afternoon, I think like around 2. Okay, so we need around 3. Um, and then we have a few days where we literally have no witnesses that are available to testify until we can put some witnesses on on Thursday. Yeah. Well, we're not here Wednesday. We're not that here was Wednesday. a day right. off on the schedule anyway. So you're, you're now we're on. talking about Thursday uh, the 15th. Correct, Your Honor. I can tell you that for tomorrow we anticipate um, probably five witnesses. One has to go on in the afternoon. Um, for Thursday, it looks like we'll probably have two witnesses. I, no, I'm sorry, not Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday, I'm also confused. Oh, okay. So Thursday we may actually only have one witness. It'll be a longer witness, but it may only be one. Uh, Friday, we don't have any, unfortunately, Your Honor. Coming back on the 20th, I believe we have off Monday. We have seven, we'll, we'll be good to go. We'll branch off on Monday, it might go over to Tuesday. Uh, sorry. We'll be good to go on Tuesday, it may go over to Wednesday, and then anticipate around then. The state will be fine. So, let me see if I got this right. Uh, we'll work a full day tomorrow, or as much of a full day as we can. Wednesday is off. Thursday, Sounds like you have a sh short. Yeah, we, we need one witness. May, no, the one witness because he's going on vacation the following week. Also. And then uh, the court holiday is Monday. You're asking for the trial to not be in session on Friday, the yeah. 16th. Correct. Right. And then you're telling me with a full day of work on Tuesday, the 20th, and then part of the day on Wednesday, the 21st. Possibly the 20th. I don't know if we'll get that you would be resting your case at that point. Yes. That's what it is. And Judge, we can bring in the defense wants to call witnesses. You're talking about on Friday. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. So we have someone who's waiting with the state to testify tomorrow at 11, 11, 15. So that's one witness. And we have two or three that are taking vacation very soon, could testify on Thursday and or Friday. Okay. On Thursday. I mean, whatever they're I mean, you all, Thursday. you all are going to uh, cooperate, and I appreciate the professionalism on both sides, but continue to do that and allow the defense to call witnesses out of order. 
whether that be Thursday or Friday, that's fine. I can't work the full day Friday just because of other obligations that I have with my FX docket. So I would probably have to stop at maybe 3.30 p.m. on Friday anyway. Uh, but um, yeah, I would rather do the work while I have the juries here. That, I'm fine with that, Your Honor. We have no objection to the defense calling witnesses okay. the Thursday or Friday afternoon. Okay, so you, I'll leave that to you all to discuss, but whatever defense witnesses can be available on Thursday, whatever defense witnesses can be available on Friday, I will say again, based on some other items on my own docket, Friday morning, I probably won't be able to start with the jury till 10 o'clock Friday morning. I'm sorry, 10 o'clock Friday morning. Thursday is a short docket, so 9.30 won't be a problem. Friday would probably be uh, 10 a.m. And then defense, if they rest their case next Tuesday or the morning of next Wednesday, then you can resume with the rest of your presentation. You can have your witnesses ready to go. Okay. I mean, again, no time limits. We're way ahead on the schedule, but how long do you think it'll take for you to put on your presentation? Within a week. Okay, so you're talking about uh, resting your case, your presentation sometime during the week of June 25th. Okay. 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 Not a problem. We'll just play that as it goes. Uh, state, anything else you need me to address before we recess the trial for today? No, Your Honor. Defense, anything else you need me to address before we recess the no, trial? No, thank you. Okay, so then the, uh, the trial will be in recess until tomorrow, which is Tuesday. June 13th at uh, 9.30. Division FX will be in recess till tomorrow. Tuesday, June 13th at 8.45 a.m. I hope you all have a good rest of your evening. You too, Jerry. All right, have a good night. Quarter. That is it.